What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. And if you don't know anything about the Mystery Ranch Fireline packs, well, maybe you should look into it. Yeah. Dana Gleason went down to a South Op shop crew, tied in with those folks. And from there, basically, they developed what you have on your back on the line. Yeah. That's where the hot shot uh, pack or the uh, hot top and all those other packs came from. It's direct direct relationships with the boots on the ground. And they have a longstanding tradition and also a promise to wildland firefighters that they will not ever change. And it's pretty badass. Yeah. So what else do they do? Well, they are also in charge of the Mystery Ranch Backbone series. Now, if you don't know what that is, well, you got until May 31st, end of May, to submit your stories. And if you're telling the story of Wildland Fire and your story is selected, well, you got an opportunity to win a $1,000 grant from Mystery Ranch in the Backbone series. It is pretty badass. If you want to find out more, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by our premier coffee sponsor, and that's going to be none other than Hotshot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. What else do they do? Well, they've done it. They've they've done quite a bit, and they continue to do so. They actually make all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, and they have a full line of Wildland Firefighter-themed apparel to help rep that wildland firefighter culture. Plus, on top of that, check this out. If you want to get some Anchor Point swag? Well, head over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and there you can find all the kick-ass coffee, all the swag, all the apparel, and all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right. Once again, that is www.hotshotbrewing.com. Go check them out. And of course, I got to give a quick little shout out to my buddy Booze over at The Ass Movement. And that stands for the anti-service shooting movement. Homie's a firefighter up there in AK and he's doing the good deed of spreading who bearing propaganda across the globe. I don't know about everybody out there that's listening, but I absolutely hate it when I see a surface turd or someone just doesn't clean up their wreckage left behind their human excrement and it's disgusting and that shit needs to stop. So not only is he one of my very close homies uh, and we work together on some other projects, uh, it, it's yeah, he's got a good mission and it was all started from humble beginnings, which you can ask him all about. Anyways, if you head over to www.thefirewild and check out the ass movement and use the code anchorpointass10 at checkout, well, you can save 10% off your entire order through the ass movement. Go check them out. Once again, that is www.thefirewild.com forward slash the ass movement. And last but not least, the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be brought to you by, well, actually, no, it's not even really brought to you by. I just have a great relationship with Bethany over there at the uh, Smoky Generation, aka the American Wildfire Experience, aka wildfireexperience.org. And it's awesome. Uh, you should definitely go over and check it out because it is a history telling and storytelling uh, project all for the boots on the ground by the boots on the ground. So if you want to do uh, check out some notes and some interesting stories from your peers in the field or some of those folks that are uh, still in the game, but uh, have a story to tell from long, long times ago. Now, some of these stories go all the way back to the 1940s and there's well over a hundred of them. So if you want a little history lesson, a little trip down memory lane or want to see what the uh, smoky generation is all about, well, go over to www wildfireexperience.org and check it out because you can win one of these $500 grants to tell your story of wildland firefighting by submitting your story and your project to the Smoky Generation. So once again, www.wildfireexperience.org. Bethany, you have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. The views and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency.
What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. So this has been a wild week and I have a ton of content and a ton of episodes to uh, share. I think I have a little over 13, 14 hours of content to share with you all. And uh, the reason why I have that is because uh, Micah Booz and I, the booze man, the ass movement man himself, we got invited down to the Bureau of Land Management uh, preseason meeting for all the employees. And we actually had the opportunity to do not only a little seminar on social health, social wellness in a modern era, which was awesome. Hope everybody that uh, sat in on that got some value out of it. But also we got to uh, mingle with some folks that uh, we kind of cut our teeth with in the fire game. So booze, Shout out to you, but also I want to give a little special shout out to Vanessa Marquez and Brock Ulig. Yeah. And also, of course, my man, we got Paul Peterson. Happy retirement, brother. Good to see you uh, starting in some new endeavors and yeah, happy retirement, man. It's awesome. Got some cool projects. Anyways, I'll talk about those later. Anyways, so fair disclaimer. Now, this is going to be a lot of uh, content regarding the specifically the Bureau of Land Management from the state of Nevada. It is where I've done a majority, a majority of my career. And uh, I learned a lot of stuff from these folks and uh, they've always treated me well. So it might seem a little bit shilly, but I got to pay credit and give some uh, love to the folks that made me who I am today, because without these folks, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be probably sitting here on this microphone. So. Anyways, today's episode is going to be all about upcoming things. Now, when I say that, we're going to be talking about the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, the changes on the horizon. I mean, it does run off and run out in October. So TikTok, I mean, we have other things that are going right now, like the uh, presidential budget. Uh, hopefully that passes, but uh, I have a well, let's just cut to the chase. Today's episode, I'm going to have a very real sit down conversation with Grant Beebe. And now if you don't know who that is, he is the assistant fire and aviation director for the Bureau of Land Management. He is one of those head honchos up there at NIFSI. And now also full disclaimer, I do not agree with everything that is going on on Capitol Hill, nor does he. However, he is kind of forced to eat the same turd sandwich as you folks in on the ground. And he does have a unique power and unique uh, position to where he can communicate with those SES and upper level Washington execs and help kind of drive that narrative and also help drive those changes. So Grant, we're all looking up to you in the Bureau of Land Management and we hope you uh, move mountains. Uh, we honestly do hope we do. We hope that you have those conversations, those difficult conversations and listen to the boots on the ground because those are the people that matter the most. Not saying that everybody else doesn't matter, but let's talk about the lowest common denominator here, those GS3 through whatevers. So like I said, I don't agree with everything and I do uh, publicly um, go against the, some of the stuff that he says. However, I do agree with some of the stuff he says as well. Um, yeah. You guys get to decipher that. And I hope that this is of value. And I hope that you guys and girls out there get to understand Grant from his position and his perspective. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Grant Beebe. Welcome to The Anchor Point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I've got a very special guest, Grant Beebe. He is the Assistant Director for the Fire and Aviation Program with the Bureau of Land Management all the way over there at NIFSI. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I know I sent you a list of kind of like questions, topics, notes and stuff. Uh, usually I don't do that. Usually everything's pretty uh, unscripted for the most part and mostly unedited but uh, yeah, we had to submit those just because of, I guess, the level of your ads, maybe. <laughs> I think, as always, people are scared of what I'm going to say. But uh, no, I think, uh, uh, as always, these are touchy subjects. And so people just want to make sure that they understand the questions they're going to get asked. But uh, um, I'm always uh, free to talk and willing to talk. And these are important issues. So you can ask me whatever you want, even if it wasn't on the list. Well, I appreciate the hell out of that. And uh, yeah, it's so... It, there's been a lot of stuff going on on Capitol Hill, a lot of questions from the boots on the ground. So 
the intent here for this show today is to kind of like bridge the gap between the boots on the ground, Nipsey and Washington. And kind of just, I mean, you're kind of in the middle of all that to, per se, but at the same time you have a, I, I guess a, an, an understanding of what's going on at the upper echelons of government and the boots on the ground. And ultimately you're going to be one of those people that has to implement some of these programs. So I definitely appreciate you being on the show today and trying to explain all this stuff. But other than that, let's get a little bit of history and background from you. Okay. Um, yeah, so you're right. I am kind of in the middle and I probably understand both ends imperfectly. Right. So I understand kind of what's going on on Capitol Hill within, within, within my purview. Right. And, uh, and I was a boot on the ground, but it's been a while. So, um, I won't say that I know exactly everything that's going on with people who are doing this job today. It's different from, different from the way I did the job, you know, a couple decades ago. So I've been out of the, out of the field for a while, but, um, I started with hand crews. So I was a forest service hand crew person in uh, Northern California and then got an opportunity to jump in, uh, in the BLM organization at the fire center in the early nineties. So we're, we're going back a couple of decades there, jumped for a while. And then, uh, when I had kids decided I needed to stay more, a little closer to home, actually had some skills that I could apply and got into budgeting, planning, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. People kept retiring. I kept applying and, uh, here I am. So happy to be here. Happy to try to represent some of those boots on the ground. Try to try to remember what it was like when I was a GS, gosh, wherever I started too. And, uh, and I'm not that anymore, but uh, I try to keep in mind what it was like. So um, I don't always, don't always do a good job of that, but I'm always trying. So here's a question for you. So the changes that you've seen over the years and, you know, used to be in ops, of course, used to jump mm -hmm. out of perfectly good aircraft, yep. used to be a ground. So no pilot. such thing, by the way, as a perfectly good aircraft. You <laughs> always want to have a, a parachute on your back when you're in an airplane. That's, that's not just me. <laughs> well, hey, if uh, the plane's not a perfectly good aircraft, well, it's going to take you one place and that's usually to the scene of the crash. There you go. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so I think one of the most overlooked things for the boots on the ground is, looking to expand your and diversify your career, right? So a lot of people just want to be ops their entire life. They want to be the lifelong hotshot superintendent or, you know, whatever in operations. As far as getting into the other things like finance and logs and radio communications, all that kind of stuff, what kind of suggestions would you go out for? Uh, what would you give for the folks that are out there right now? Well, you know, one thing that's different now than, than it was when I was coming up is that there are a lot more opportunities now, I think. So just across the Bureau, the Bureau of Land Management, for instance, I and mean, we got so many vacancies in so many different departments that if people have interest in other things, they're always looking for help. I think one of the beautiful things that's going on now is we're, we're having an opportunity to extend people's tours more than we have in the past. I mean, you know, not to, not to bring it all back to where I started, but it took me, you know, 10 years to get an appointment in the agency. And, uh, and it's different for people now. You can, get, you can get a career appointment earlier. You can work longer fire seasons than uh, we used to, longer, longer, longer tours. So I think there's more opportunity for people to branch out if they've got an interest or, Pretty much everybody out there in the bureau needs help, and so when people come available in the shoulder seasons and in, in the in the winter months, they still want to work. Often there's work for them, and they just got to ask. So, you know, for me, it's um, it was it was kind of a natural fit for me to go into budgeting. That's where I went. I went into kind of planning and budgeting when I when I did hit that end of that ops career that uh, where I, where I wanted to stop traveling so much. But I had fewer opportunities, I guess, back then. That was in the mid to the mid aughts, right? And I think now there, there are a lot more opportunities than there were back then, but, but I just had this, I was in the right place at the right time. And I got a budgeting job because I love to do spreadsheets. Not everybody does, but I did. So, uh, I turned that into a budgeting thing and, and frankly, I actually loved that work. It was really, it was really pretty fun. Got to do some op stuff off to the side, but, um, that was a good transition for me. Wouldn't be for everybody. I think, like you mentioned, you know, radio, uh, GIS, uh, remote, remote weather stations, um, fuels work for instance. I mean, there's a ton of fuels work out there, planning work, just helping people out on, on stuff that they need help on admin functions. You know, there, there's all sorts of work out there that needs to get done. So I think people, you know, first step is to, is to tell the folks who are in your supervisory chain that you got an interest outside of just doing the op stuff and see what they can do with it. Uh, one thing we talked about, we were doing a preseason meeting this morning, you know, with the Nevada folks. And and one thing we do talk about all the time is really trying to keep people um, in the, in the bureau, in the business, right. And, and not just kind of drive them so hard in the ops chain that they, that they have to turn their back on, on the career because it's just too hard to do. So we're always trying to preach that, that, um, you know, 
uh, work a long season if, if you can, but, but for sure, look for other opportunities to develop a skill set so that when you do decide either voluntarily or involuntarily that you no longer want to be pounding the ground, be digging line, that there's something else out there that you're, you're ready and, and able to do. Uh, I did a little bit of that. I went to grad school and, you know, perfected my, uh, my spreadsheet skills and was able to apply those skills to a different job when, when I made that choice. But yeah, you know, sometimes that choice is made for you. You blow out a knee, you, uh, you develop asthma. Um, uh, you just, frankly, your, your family situation changes and you just can't travel anymore. You want to be ready for that when it happens, if, if you possibly can. I'll just say as a, as a bureau, as a community, we're trying to make it easier on folks when that day comes and, uh, and to have them ready and ready and willing and able to, to make a transition and stick with us if they will. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that are, I was trying to kind of allude to is I'm a huge proponent of, ex, I guess, expanding your horizons and uh, getting some more experience under your belt and kind of diversifying your career that way in case you do take a gnarly fall on a jump or you do blow out your knee hot shotting, you have options out there and you can still put food on the plate. So yeah, totally. I mean, we, um, last year had a, had a jumper drop out of training and, and, uh, we were able to pull him into our external affairs shop. He went to work on external affairs for the summer, developed some skills and, uh, and it was a great, it was a great thing for him and a great thing for us too, to have this operational person, this person who was, you know, fresh off the line, come in and help external affairs stuff, do some, do some work. So, um, there are always opportunities out there. You just got to be a little imaginative and figure out what you want to do. If, if there's something beyond ops you want to do, um, by all means, just ask the question, raise your hand and, and, you know, learn on the job is always the best way to learn stuff. Oh yeah. And I hate when people kind of do that whole, oh, well, all I've known is operations. That's all I am. I'm just a firefighter. Well, no, it's bigger than that. You're a professional problem solver and you're pretty damn good at it. So totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the, one of the beauties of fire and why we always talk about having other people come in and help us manage fires is because they get to get to practice things like leadership, decision-making, um, collaboration, uh, public speaking, all those things that, uh, you get to do as a fire person kind of on a routine basis that other people could only dream about. So yeah, don't sell yourself short. If you're a, if you're a ground pounder, you got a ton of skills, uh, you just need to apply them in the right spot. There we go. Everybody's got something to offer, right? Totally. So last but not least for the toy, before we get into like the meat and potatoes, if you will, of this episode, let's talk about the fire behavior when you're coming up through the ranks and what you experienced out there and how it's changed today. Yeah, at the risk of at the risk of reusing a story, I I I, I use this a lot, and uh, I just remember in guard school, I was in Northern Cal going through going through basic, and uh, we would talk about you know the big fires that people had seen and experienced. They were just kind of the war stories people would talk about during you know in one thirty one ninety those kind of introductory courses, and you know they would talk about this fire called Gordo rat fire and, uh, the fat rat fire. It was fat rat. Yes. If you want to translate, but you know how, you know how it goes. So the fat rat fire and, uh, named, I think for the fat rat campground, uh, don't, don't quote me or a hey, creek or a creek. You know, there's always something like that. The fat rat go with top gun names for fires. Oh uh, yes. Right. The goose fire. <laughs> so, uh, so that fire was, I don't know, it was on the lost batteries and it was, you know, I'm making it up 130,000 acres or something like that. And then you compare it to, you know, your basic year in California these, these days with the Dixie fire or the, you name it, Caldo or camp or car. And so the kind of fires that were held up as calamitous fires in California when I was, when I was kind of cutting my teeth um, as a college kid trying to pay, trying to pay his way through school are, are way different from the, from the war stories people are telling now about, about, you know, Dixie hitting a million acres. Um, so, so big fires, different fire behavior, longer lasting uh, different seasons, all that kind of stuff. We've been, we've been saying it actually for three decades, but I think we're finally um, getting across to people that this is different. This is not what we grew up with in the fifties or the sixties or the seventies or the eighties or the nineties or in the aughts or even five years ago. I mean, it is changing. Um, it feels like more than, more than mathematically possible, right? That, that things are getting way more intense. And on top of it, we're seeing effects of fires that we didn't see before. And, and, you know, I think we're running the risk of losing entire ecosystems, at least in our lifetimes, forest types that might not reestablish, uh, you know, we're, I think we're running the risk of, of changing the landscape in such a way that um, we're going to be missing some particular, you know, pieces of the landscape that we've grown used to over the years. Yeah. And it sucks to see that too, because, you know, we grew up, I, I, at least I grew up and probably a majority of wild and firefighters out there grew up doing outdoor stuff. I mean, right. It's just kind of a natural calling, right? And now you're seeing this generational damage across forest and it's all because of these 
mega fires, giga fires, whatever you want to call it in the Steve Prine uh, kind of context. But yeah, it's, it's happening. Tied with climate change, right? So, so yep. yeah, you may have a fire drive a system uh, into, uh, into some seral state and then, uh, and then it will never come back in our lifetimes because of the, you know, available moisture and the temperature regime. So um, I, there's, there's a real concern that uh, we need to preserve some landscapes and we can't just let nature run its course, uh, you know, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there is definitely an application for good fire across the totally. landscapes, but it's, you know, it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. It is one of the safest ways to fight fire with fire. And it is also effectively nature's garbage disposal, but we got to apply that practically and in the right time, the right environment, the right forest, the right ecology, all that stuff. Agreed. Yeah. As we talk about hitting fuels targets, for instance, and the kind of fuels treatments that we need to do as land management agencies, you know, and, and I'm talking inclusive here, fed agencies, state, local, um, we need to account for good fire, however it shows up. If we're lighting it, that's one thing. If it's occurring from a lightning strike and we're and we're shepherding a fire around to do good things, uh, absolutely. But that's the only way we're going to hit the acre targets that we need to hit is making use of fire that occurs on the landscape without without us needing to set it. I mean, got to got to admit that that's part of the equation for sure. Oh yeah. And here's a question for you that wasn't really on the list. Um, speaking of those pop-up questions, as far as targets, I mean, what are our targets as far as fuels treatments across the West, just the West, or I mean, even if you want to throw it in a nationwide thing, I think um, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, I think, I think we should admit that we're going to burn 10 to 20 million acres a year across, across the West one way or another, just on average. The question is how much of that are we going to light ourselves and how much of that is going to be lit for us? Um, but, and so, and so that's what we should expect for burning. What, what we want to see is that when those 10 million acres burn, that those 10 million acres burn in a majority of places in a way in which we want them to burn. They create the effects that we want. So that's the goal. Not that we banish burning from the landscape because this is a fire environment. We live in nature and it's, it's built by fire and it's, it's always going to burn. But is it burning in a way that we can live with, right? That people can live with uh, because of where they recreate, where they live. And that and, um, fire that's creating the kind of ecological effects that we want it to, to create on the far end, right? So that's the goal. The way we get there is, you know, sometimes suppressing fire, sometimes using it and doing a hell of a lot more fuels management than we have been just by virtue of, of you know, both effort and uh, other priorities and money. Um, so for my agency, for BLM, you know, informally, We've been aiming for a million acres of treatment a year and, you know, we, we manage about 240 million. So a millions, it seems like a lot, but it's, it's, it's small compared really. to that 240 million yeah. of that 240 million. That's not all high priority work. So, so say that we have 80 million acres that we really want to focus on in the BLM because of values and, and those values could be homes, but they could be grazing allotments. They could be community interests, uh, things that people depend on. They could be timber interests. They could be recreational values. So say we got 80 million acres um, to really manage intensively because of fire risk and we want to treat, or we have been treating about a million now and that, that was an aspirational goal and we got to it. This year, we're hoping to hit somewhere around 1.3 million acres treated. I think as, as, as a group, we're, we're aiming to 2 million acres a year. So of that 80 million, if we're treating 2 million acres a year, we think we're on a pretty decent glide path. Um, but I'm, I, I say this a lot too. This is a generational investment, right? This is not one and done. This is not a budget cycle. This is not a political thing. This is what we need to do forever. We need to be treating 2 million acres until I'm dead, you're dead, our kids are dead, and our grandkids are dead. And that just needs to be going on and on and on. This is not something that we're going to treat and be done. And then look, we don't have to fight fire anymore. Or, you know, look, uh, we don't need hot shots. Uh, no, we're always going to be managing fire. But if we can get a landscape in better shape, and I, again, I'm speaking for my agency here, if we get if we get the landscape in better shape, we're going to be able to make better use of fire. We're going to be beating our heads against the wall, maybe a little bit less, and we'll have fewer deleterious effects on the far end when fires do occur. But you know, also in, in the BLM land, a lot of what we manage um, is is really full suppression ground. It's ground that's burning too much. Yep. It's uh, rangeland that's degraded and that is burning every three to four to five years and should be burning every 25 to 75 to 100 years, right? And, and so we've had a lot of places where, where we flat out just have too many exotic invasives coming in. Cheat grass is, you know, a noted, noted example. Winnemucca. Uh, Winnemucca. <laughs> yeah, drive north from Winnemucca to Burden Valley and you see it. 
And uh, yeah, we get a lot of land where we need to put fire out um, for a long time to to try to recover that landscape. And, you know, that's a big emphasis in, in our bureau for sure. And then we also have landscapes where we need to do a little more burning. Um, uh, juniper for sure, got juniper encroachment. And there's a lot of discussion about, about how much is the right amount of pinion juniper. Uh, we know sage grouse could use a little more opened pinion juniper stands. We know we've got we've got pinion jay that's a, a different species that has different dependencies, and we got people who also depend on pinion nuts. But um, we got to find a balance there because we got we got a lot of pinion juniper, and uh, we think we need to manage that a little more intensively also, and that might require more fire use. Oh yeah, and that's a good way to get rid of the stuff too, especially in the areas that it's you know overgrown. I mean. You're going to have to nuke it out, of course, but yeah, it yeah, requires and, intense and, fire. And anybody who's done uh, PJ work knows, yeah, if, uh, you know, in-season in burning is really uh, one, of the, one of the only ways to deal with it um, on, a, on a big scale, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's scary because that gets up in the crowns and just rolls. So, um, oh, yeah. so it, it takes a while. But uh, for instance, in the Boise area where we are in the, in the Oahis, um, Boise District's been doing a great job of getting the landscape set up so that they can let for more fires burn out there, you know, um, burning some holes out there. So they've got more, more, um, uh, fine fuel growth so that, so that fires will actually do more good and burn into some of those stands. So they're setting it up for success long-term. Again, these are all long-term, long-term investments, long-term goals. Uh, my, my worry with, with a lot of these investments is that people, you know, they'll see a big fire season next year or the year after, and they'll say, Oh my God, what are we doing? We're throwing all this money at fire and we're still having big fire seasons. Yes. We're going to have big fire seasons. Buckle up. For, yeah. For your, in the piracy. For our lifetimes and that next lifetime. It's just, it is, um, it is where we're going. And, uh, you know, until the weather changes for a decade and it uh, doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. Oh yeah. Well, that's another thing too. I mean, that 2 million acres that you're talking about, that's a drop in the bucket comparatively speaking to other, the other agencies out there. I mean, well, the other department, the department of agriculture, you know, United States Forest Service. I mean, they've got much more land, I want to say. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know the Forest Service numbers right now, but they probably treat 2 million acres in the Southeast on an annual basis. And those are different burns. They're doing more maintenance burning. And and of course, you know, in the Southeast, generally, really in the state and private sector, I mean, those guys are burning way more aggressively on, on shorter intervals because they have to, because of the ecological nature of the Southeast, right? With longleaf pine and, mm -hmm. and um, all that stuff that's going on down there. Plus their, their incredible history of doing, of doing burning. Um, and so, you know, we can't export that model from the Southeast to the West very easily. Mm, different landscape, like that. yeah, <laughs> different, different fuels, different topography, different weather. Uh, I, you know, the forest service, I think would, would like to get to a much bigger numbers in the West and, and that's their goal across fire sheds, priority fire sheds, the chief's priorities. I mean, you see all that stuff, uh, rolling out, um, it's, it's great stuff. It's going to take a lot of work on the forest service part to really hit the targets that they're trying to hit on in the, in the West. A lot of it is going to be, um, taking advantage of, of natural ignitions, you know, where they can, I'm sure, I'm sure that's going to be part of it because they're, that's probably the only way to hit some of the big goals that they have. Oh yeah. Then we also have kind of a, a little bit of a people problem that we're starting to develop here. And I guess that's a good segue into the next set of topics that we're going to be uh, talking about. And that is going to be all of the gripes, I guess, from both the public and the boots on the ground. Now, I don't want to say these gripes because there is change on the horizon. And I do believe that with enough uh, guidance that the federal government, legislators and the agencies can direct this into a positive change for the boots on the ground. Because, I mean, you agreed with me. You said, yeah, we do have a people problem currently. And it I, is it getting worse? I mean... I think we're holding our own, but, um, again, it's, it's anecdotal. I saw boy a month ago, some attrition data that, um, for my, for my bureau, at least that talked about, you know, what, when, when in people's careers do they leave the agency and what series? And so I can see, for instance, that, you know, four, six twos most where most of our, uh, forest techs, current, current forest techs are soon to be, soon to be, um, four, five, six wildland fire specialists or whatever we're going to end up titling them, uh, wildland firefighters. Um, those folks tend to leave at the GS six, seven level. Right. And so at least for permanent employees, that's, that's the way they depart. And that's where that, I was. That's where a lot of people are. Right. It's like, all right, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm not, you know, there's no transition plan in place or I don't like what's, what's above me in the, in the pay grade scale or whatever, or we have fewer opportunities at that next grade than we should, which I think is really one of the problems. Um, especially yeah. for people who want to transition into something that's 
less opsy, that's less travel, that's a little different. Um, that's, it's a tough grade level to, to make that transition. I think what we want to do, at least in the fire organization, is build more opportunities so that if you're a GS7-8 and, you know, you you want to be done with that GS7-8 work because it entails duties that you can't handle anymore, you know, for whatever reason, um, that there's not, there's something else out there for you that maybe within the fire organization, that's, that's more fuels work. That's, that's, um, more tied to home base that, you know, has some different set of duties that you can still contribute, can still go do some fire stuff, but don't necessarily have to be on the road all the time. I mean, that's the goal. And I think a lot of what we're doing is trying to build out the organization, um, not just, not just building the boots on the ground, doing firefighting work, but also the support organizations that have been underfunded, understaffed in the past that also give people more opportunities or to just flat out give people, you know, I'll air quote it sabbatical time, give them, give them say, you know, time to do something different. Like you want to take a season, do something different. I mean, personally, I've done that a couple of times in, in just in my job. And I don't have a lot of boots on the ground in my organization other than the smoke jumper unit, but I had a couple of guys who want to go out and, and learn to fly say, okay, um, yeah, take a year off, go, go learn to fly and come back. And so it's been super successful. And I think that model has to happen more. People have to be more ingenious as managers about, about recognizing they've invested in this employee who's invested his or her time in the organization. Let's keep that relationship going. Uh, look for, look for a way to, to feed those interests, give somebody an opportunity either inside or outside of government and then, and then bring them back in. Uh, those are the kinds of things that need to happen at every level so that we keep people in the organization and they don't just bail out on us. But uh, we have a people problem. We have, we have people leaving the organization for a variety of reasons, but um, I think not lost on us is that they can make more money doing easier work elsewhere. It could be in a, it could be working for PG&E doing firework for PG&E. It could be going to work for Cal Fire doing, you know, firework for Cal Fire. It could be working for Colorado. It could be working for Oregon, Washington. I'm trying to think of all the states that pay more than the federal government, at least before bill, um, that we're paying more than the federal government for, for doing the same work, for doing firework. So part of part of what happened with Bill, with the infrastructure law, and and with President Biden actually coming out and just saying every firefighter should be making at least fifteen bucks an hour, was was that pay inequity that people were doing the same work in state organizations or in other organizations, private organizations, and getting paid less. And uh, so that that was the first recognition. And then the infrastructure law came around and said, well, let's apply that to everybody regardless of where they live, and bump up that pay and try to make it commensurate both with other organizations that are doing the same work and just with the general level of risk that's attributed to the job that, that should be compensated just flat out by itself. It's like, you're, you're doing this hard work. Uh, we should pay you better than $13 an hour. Right. And, and so yeah. you see, you know, GS threes making in the mid twenties, which is, which is awesome. It's perfect. <laughs> it's not sustainable. If you're going to stay at a GS three, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and as, uh, as you, you know, as you alluded, that doesn't, that hasn't necessarily fixed our problem. Right. So, uh, I think there's two things going on out there. One, it's not just about pay. It's also about, uh, the life that it requires, you know, that that's required of you to, to make this pay count. Right. So, uh, you still got to travel. You still got to work a lot of overtime. You're still on the road a lot. There's still a lot of pressures, still dangerous job. And, uh, and plus the, the permanent fix isn't there yet. And I, I'm, I'm sure most people are hip to that, that they're waiting to see uh, if Congress will come through with some kind of permanent fix as opposed to this um, kind of Band-Aid approach that we've had so far. Yeah, it's definitely a Band-Aid. And uh, moving back to what you were saying earlier about having your most attrition at that GS4 to GS7 level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, I think that's a life issue compounded with... <clears throat> I guess your, your pay and all the, your classification, all that other stuff. Right. So when I was a GS six, seven, I was getting married. I was trying to buy my first house. I, it was like serious about it. Right. And I think that's why a lot of those mid-level, uh, career persons, I guess that would be mid low, mid mm -hmm. kind of career professionals in the fire service are dipping out and going and finding other jobs, either in the private sector or if a different uh, agency in a different state is because you have this sudden realization that your ground pounding is very much a young man and young woman sport. And when you settle down and want to have kids and have the two and a half of the two and a half kids, white picket fence, you know, American dream that it's really hard to do on 16, $17 an hour, even with the BIL with a uh, bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law, it's, it's got an expiration date on it. Right. It's well, hard. Yeah. Uh, so housing, okay, we could do a whole podcast just on housing. Oh but, man, um, you're telling me. But, but again, that's not unique to us. Um, it's, 
uh, you know, housing is housing right now. And, and there isn't, there isn't an industry that isn't affected by the lack of affordable housing for its workers. Um, I'll it just, doesn't even matter if you're in tech in San Francisco. It's no, like, no I, yeah. I work at a fire center where we hire a lot of GS 12s, 13s, 14s, right? And we get a lot of people up in that pay scale, which is, which is considerably, at least for base pay, considerably higher than, than, you know, your GS seven. And, uh, and those folks, have a hard time moving. I mean, you have a hard time getting every, anybody to move right now, especially with, with interest rates being what they are. It's, oh, yeah. a, it's a huge investment, but you know, in my market in the Boise market, and that is not atypical people were buying houses over the internet. Um, side unseen. Side, yeah, Cash. most almost unseen or seen through, you know, whatever fish eye lens that somebody wanted to use on their, on their Zillow listing. <laughs> so, um, so people were, people were just flat out just buying what they could because they were desperate. And, uh, and so that's a hard, that's a hard thing. I mean, i I did buy my picket fence when I was GS seven, mm-hmm. my wife and I, you know, pooled our savings. I borrowed some from my mom and we, uh, when we managed a down payment and, and got a house, but it's not the same world now for sure. And so housing, housing, yeah, housing is, is, is its own thing. How we're going to figure that out. I mean, you know, that's a different discussion really with the country figuring out how to build more housing. Oh yeah. Cause, cause it's uh, not the same across the country. It like is, it is not. Yeah. yeah and rent and, and rents are high too. Um, you know, you name it, there's, there's, it is a tough market in pretty much every Western town that I can think of right now. So, so it's not just Sacramento. It's not just Reno. It's not just Boise. It is, it is Winnemucca. It's, it's all sorts of towns. It is Elko Ely. Yeah. It is, it is a, it is a hard thing. People as a result, you know, if they don't have housing provided for them are, you know, faced with living out of their van and hoping that they go off on a lot of fires so that they, uh, they don't have to, you know, live in their van every day. They go off on per diem and, and manage to get a hotel and get a shower. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. And that's where I say, you know, I, my boots on the ground experience is different from, from what folks have these days, but, but uh, it is a tough time. It's a, it's a tough time in people's careers that the GS seven, eight level, it's like, all right, what am I going to do? Am I going to do this for a career or do I have to do something else? I think we are still going to lose a lot of people at that grade level. They're going to say, yep, uh, this was fun. I don't want to, I don't want to do more of this. I don't want to, I don't want to bump up a level and become a supervisor or whatever. There, a lot of people are going to make that choice and, and flat out that is, that is going to happen. But uh, we want to give more opportunities for people who do think, oh, you know what? I, I love fire. I'd like to stay involved, but I don't necessarily want to be pounding the ground. What else can I do that feels like fire that, that um, maybe is a little um, less like the job I've been doing. And and that's where, I, that's where I say building out fuels organizations, building out incident business, building out warehouse support, all these kinds of jobs that, that we should be supporting better with, with some of these funds that we're getting. Uh, that's what we're trying to do is, is trying to build that organization. We're building that organization because we need those skills, but, um, but it also hopefully will give an opportunity for folks who, who want to make that life decision where they, where they stop traveling quite so much, but still work in the field or do something else for us. Yeah. Go work GIS, go, you know, go do, go do this other thing. There, there are all sorts of great opportunities out there in public lands management that aren't firefighting. And that, like I say, people are screaming to fill jobs. So it's a great opportunity in a lot of ways to be somebody entering the field. Cause, uh, cause it is, you know, it won't take 10 years to get an appointment the way it did for me, you know, and, that, and that's not, that's not sour grapes on my part. That's just saying, Hey man, it is, a, it is a buyer's market and, uh, you're the seller. So if you got something you want to do, make an offer and probably somebody will jump at it. Yeah. And that's another thing too. You have to move around to actually, you know, move up in your career. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I mean, you can pipeline and or stove pipe all of your career ladders to, perfect. Right. But in the reality of it is, is you got to go get other experience and other fuel types, other areas, all that other stuff to diversify your career. And it's, if you're just going to be sitting around in the same forest service station or BLM outstation duty station, it's, you're not really going to progress as fast as you want. And I just don't know any other way to put it other than that. It's kind of a choice you make. I think, yeah. I think some people make that choice. It comes with a consequence though. Yeah. You, you fall in love with the place and you, and you see what you can do in that place. And some people have made that work just fine. Um, but, uh, I, as you say, I think getting well-rounded is, is a, is a great way to operate is to move around and get a lot of experience. One of the beauties of fire is that you move around just in your own job, right? If you, if you are an operational person and you're doing a lot of fire assignments, you actually get a lot of experience in a lot of different fuel types just by your day job, you know, and you don't, you don't necessarily have to move, but, um, you know, there is, there is that tradition in the, in the agency of moving around a lot, move, move around to move up. Yep. Um, I think now with, with, 
remote work and telework that's changed a little bit. And, and there are a lot more remote opportunities, you know, in our agency right now than there used to be where people are saying, well, okay, you don't have to, you don't have to live in Salt Lake city to have this job, but you got to live somewhere in Utah. That's a much different, much different solution than we used to have where it used to be, you know, all right, you must, you must move to this other town. So here's your cubicle. Here's, here's your cubicle. Yeah, Which everybody it. cringes about, yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. your operational folks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cubicle, cubicle town is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real thing, but, uh, I, I think we're a lot more flexible in what we do now. And there are a lot more opportunities, uh, to work in a more flexible manner in the federal government than there used to be. And that's, uh, that's mostly a good thing. Oh yeah. But I will say that being a young person in your 20 somethings, there is something wildly attractive about being practically living out of your car, that dirtbag lifestyle. I'm just going to say it. I mean, you and I have lived that yes, right to yes. some degree. I yes. mean, there's something kind of enchanting about that dirtbag lifestyle, but that GS six, seven spot when you're starting to get you know, serious with your, your wife or your girlfriend, you're having kids. It's, it's hard. Oh, it is. And, uh, like I said, that was a decision I made it, when it was just my wife and I, um, she had her own business and it was hard. I mean, you know, I would check out for 90 days and she would have to get used to me when I got back, just like everybody has experienced or many people have experienced. Um, so, so that was hard. But then when we had kids, that was a whole nother thing. And, oh, and, yeah. and, you know, that was, that was, that was me just saying, you know, I don't want to be the absentee dad. And luckily I was able to transition out. I was at a point in my career where most people aren't. And, and, you know, I wasn't a GS7. I wasn't locked into an option. I didn't have to keep taking fire assignments to make ends meet. I was incredibly lucky. I also delayed, you know, having a child until I was um, a little older and a little more established, but um, that's hard. You know, and I, I, you know, pity anybody who's having to make that hard call. Cause that is, that is really tough and nobody wants to be missing their kids events and, and, um, leaving to their spouse, you know, major chunks of child rearing. Oh, yeah. uh, that feels, that feels unfair. Uh, unfortunately the way, the way the world works these days, usually that's males pawning off those duties on females. Uh, you know, just that's the way it's typically gone. And, uh, and that's probably not going to change in our lifetimes either. So, it's a hard call to be, to be, you know, a spouse and saying, you take care of the, you take care of our kids. Uh, I'm just going to go be the breadwinner winner. Um, that feels awful to me, at least as a, as a parent. So, um, and I know, you know, many people going through that and many people don't have the luxury that I had of, of opting out. So, um, I do feel, feel lucky for being able to do that. Oh yeah. The people at home are oftentimes the people that have to bear the burden of the firefighter out doing operations, you know, during totally. the summer. And it's like, it, that's one of the reasons why I got out of the game is because one was to pay. Reno is a very extraordinarily expensive town to live in. And my family's here, my wife's family's here, all that stuff, right? My kids are growing up next to their grandparents. It's just cool. However, <laughs> you need X amount of dollars to make that dream a reality. Yep. And living out of my truck with a two-year-old and a 10-month-old, it's just not going to happen. Right. <laughs> Thankfully. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I had, I made that, that decision. I consciously made that decision. I have no regrets about that. Do I miss it? Absolutely. But looking back, I mean, oh man, I, I couldn't imagine some of the burdens that some of the folks on the boots on the ground actually have to face. And right. that's something that I, I, I opted out of, right. you opted out of, yep. but it's, it's a real thing. It's, it's a real thing. It yeah. is. Absolutely. And, and, you know, people are torn about it. I'm sure, you know, like love the job, love my family, got to make a choice, uh, or do both poorly, which I think is, must feel bad as well. So, I mean, that's the goal is to, is to give more folks more opportunities when they're faced with those sorts of things. And, and we're, we're talking about kids. It doesn't have to be kids. It could just be, I, I'm just burned out on this lifestyle. I want to do something different. So, um, if we can find homes for those folks when they, when they reach that day, or even if it's, even if it's temporary, even if it's, I just need a year off, you know, we gotta, we gotta be able to find that solution there keep people in, uh, don't, don't lose them permanently there. If we can, if we can help it. Oh yeah. And it's especially hard for uh, dual fire. Oh yeah. Oh, my, oh uh, man. Yeah. No. Gosh. I, yeah. I know, I know some of those and yeah, it is, it is, uh, it's beyond comprehension how they manage it, but they do, you know, and it's genius. And, and I said this earlier, we're, we're talking, we're talking a lot today about the challenges in the work. Uh, I just want to put a plug in for how how awesome this job is too. And so what, I think oh, yeah. what we're trying to it's do awesome. is we're trying to bring people in, you know, who've got an affinity for taking care of the land, taking care of people, taking care of fire, taking, taking care of business, right? And it's a, it's a, it's an amazing profession. There are all sorts of opportunities in it. It is a profession. It's, uh, it teaches you things you, you know, won't learn anyplace else or, or very few other places. 
uh, and it gives you opportunities to experience things you won't experience anywhere else, including teamwork, teamwork, camaraderie, um, sense of purpose, sense of mission, all that kind of stuff that attract people to the job. We just want to, we just want to say, all right, that stuff's still there, but let's make it, let's make it a long-term livable job as well. Not just something cool that you do. And then, and then, you know, by definition, you have to burn out on because it's unsustainable. We wanna, but we do want to recognize that uh, it's a great job and uh, we want to we want to keep plugging that, that there's a reason to come work for us because sometimes we make it seem like there's no reason to come work for us. But uh, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's the whole thing is like, despite all the gripes, bitches and moans that we have as operators on the ground, you know, I, I will 100% say that this job, in fact, I was having this uh, conversation with Kevin Kelly earlier today, superintendent of uh, Silver State. And uh, it was like, you know what, man, honestly, some of the lessons that I've learned in wildland fire have been some of the most influential things in my entire life. And it's actually, it, it's, it's undoubtedly formed me into who I am as a person today. Right. right. And it's, it's done wonders for me. And that experience alone, plus all the friends, the fire family and all the cool untouched by humanity nature that you do get to see, right. whether it's, it happens to be on fire or not on fire. Uh, that it's irreplaceable. It's, totally. it's a beautiful job. I just, <laughs> change is happening. It's just got to be slow. Right. And now if we can attract those new applicants and retain our current workforce with these new changes that are on the horizon, then this would be a dream job, an right. absolute dream job for all walks of GS level. Right. So we're getting there. It's just bureaucracy is a very large and cumbersome ship and it's very hard to turn. Yeah. And we're, and we're talking about big changes. And so one way to think of it is that it's going really slow. Another way to think of it is that it's going incredibly fast. It's like, you know, the last three years, monumental changes. Totally. Have happened. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the, just at the legislation that's stacked up out there that, you know, that we see you proposed for the most part, but it's like, holy moly, look at all this stuff. And, uh, you know, if one tenth of this comes true, we're going to be in much different, much better spot. But, but, um, it, it does take, again, it's a long-term commitment. It's, it's like, you know, we, we're really worried just that uh, we'll lo people lose interest. And it's like, all right, you know, we're going to be the next issue. And it, it can't be the next issue. It's got to be every year's issue. This has got to just stay front front foremost in people's minds. Oh, absolutely. And this fire's not going away. Not. It's not. It's never going to go away. And in fact, if it did, we'd be in trouble as a, as a species. Right. Right. <laughs> we are inexorably, inexorably connected with fire. We wouldn't have evolved as a species unless it was for fire. Yeah. So yeah. let's just keep that around. Yeah. If we don't have fire, that means everything's turned into a, into a desert and, uh, and then we're going to be moving north. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be headed to Canada. Yeah. Sorry, Canada. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You didn't want 350 million of your closest neighbors coming, did you? <laughs> don't worry. I like hockey. So we're good. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the topics and concerns. So this is a wonderful job. I will state that. However, there are some very real uh, things that we need to address as far as how we not necessarily treat our firefighters, just I guess the way our bureaucracy works and some of the things that we need to, I guess, re-engineer, revamp, re-look at in some way. And those things are happening, especially with the efforts of grassroots wildland firefighters, NIFI, and all the boots on the ground. There's been a big change of the silent professional of the old school into this transitory kind of like, oh, well, cause some people are going to be vocal about it. Not all of them. But nowadays we have a lot of people standing up and saying, shouting from the rooftops, like, hey, we need this. And it's all walks of life, including, you know, people at the upper echelons of government all the way down to your GS3. And I applaud those people and the efforts that they're making. However, these questions right here uh, that I submitted to you, um, they are directly uh, crowdsourced from the audience of Anchor Point Podcast. So for the folks out there who submitted their questions for Grant here, I definitely appreciate you. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Okay. So, Number one topic and concern, and these are ordered by like severity and like how many times they came up. Okay. So keep that in mind here. So pay and retention. We kind of brushed on this earlier uh, with our, our rants, our, our, our chat, little side note that we went down there, a little uh, thing. But uh, number one topic and concern is going to be pay and retention. And uh, it goes, people are scared about the uncertainty of the BIL, the bipartisan infrastructure law. And it's looming expiration. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but that is going to be expiring October 10 this year it, it technically it expires when the money go, when the money runs out and so we're ballparking when that'll be but say early fall early fall okay many fear that they're going to be going back down to the pay schedules and rates before that uh 
before the work that grassroots wildland firefighters and NFFE have accomplished with this, what do you want people to know uh, regarding this? Uh, so the, the, the cliff is real. The, um, the bill had a certain amount of money for the foresters and the DOI to pay the supplement that people have been uh, experiencing since last summer. Um, and then that was retroactive to when the law got passed. So that would have been, you know, October 1st of 21, right? It was retroactive to then, and then it's been paying for it ever since. So we did retro retroactive payments last year, caught people up, and then have been paying forward. Um, when we run out of money, we run out of authority to do that. So, the, so that was particular to a law that Congress passed, and it was the infrastructure law. It was bipartisan, so hence the, the bill language or IIJW, whatever, however you want to term it. Um, there are other dollars that are still floating around in bill and we're doing fuels work with it, but they all had specific dollar amounts and specific targets for those dollars. So uh, it is absolutely true that um, those funds will uh, expire and that Congress, this is a congressionally mandated um, initiative. And so Congress needs to do something. Um, they probably have a number of some things they could do. They could do another bill. They could do, um, God knows what, but, um, but of particular interest for us is the 24 budget proposal that went forward. Um, so the president's budget, we call it, which included, um, uh, ways to get to, uh, similar pay supplements to what the bill has been doing for firefighters and, um, and then the legislative that's re the legislation says re that's required to do that, and then the money that's required to do it. So it takes it takes uh, money from Congress to pay those salaries into the future, and then it takes some congressional action to actually uh, force the change in our payroll systems that that allows it to happen. That's the easiest way to describe it. So so the the solutions that have been proposed have um, are kind of in discussion still about, about what exactly it looks like, but it's a, it's a different pay table for fire folks, people who are in special fire retirement coverage, uh, if that makes sense to your listeners, First. I think it will mm -hmm. for, to, to special retirement. So firefighter, primary and secondary firefighter retirement, those are the people who are getting the pay supplement. Now, those are the people who are proposed to get it in the 24 budget. And, uh, if Congress acts on that presidential budget and, and enacts part of it, uh, as described, then from October 1st, those, uh, this new way of looking at pay supplement would come into force and people would never, well, they would, they would notice a difference because the pay amounts will change, but, um, but they at least would continue to be getting the pay supplement or some sort of pay supplement. Let me just say that. Um, so, so two things have to have to happen. Congress has to give us some money to do this and they have to, and they have to do some legislative fixes to, to something called a pay table for, for firefighters. Um, that's, you know, I'm looking at my watch. What is it? It's uh, April 14th. I don't know what the hell is the date today. So uh, there's not, I don't, I don't know. Oh, we're 18th. Yeah, we're 18th. 18th. Yeah, 18th. sorry. Yeah, my taxes, <laughs> my taxes are in. My taxes are in. Phew. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's April 18th. You know, it's not a lot of time. No, uh, it's not. And Congress is still negotiating debt ceiling and uh, other things. And there's a lot of posturing on, on you know, what, what, what should or shouldn't happen in relation to deficits and, uh, you know, you name it. Um, regardless, uh, there is a lot of support to my understanding. There's a lot of support for this initiative. There's a lot of support for paying firefighters more, um, as appropriate. There's a lot of support for getting this done. Firefighting is a white hat thing. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about fire is that it doesn't really matter who's in the white house or who's in Congress. Uh, nobody ever, nobody ever says go away firefighters. Right. So, nope. so this it's is bipartisan. This, it is bipartisan. Bi it is bipartisan and there's bipartisan support. I think it's just, it's part of that whole negotiation process. I think everybody wants to do this. It, it'll be a question of how they get it done, but you know how this stuff works. It, it nothing, nothing happens without some countermeasure happening out there. This is how, this is how Congress works. And so it is going to be fraught with, discussion and brinksmanship and everything else. And it's going to be a chip, you know, it's like, well, we'll do this. If you do that, I, I'm pretty confident. I'm usually not a glass half full guy on everything, but I, this is too, this is too crazy not to happen. The legislative fix for the pay and, and some funding to pay for it. At the very least, I think the legislative fix on the pay table is going to happen. I, I do have a concern that we're going to have to scramble to figure out how to pay for it. But, um, but if nothing else, uh, it, we would be forced to pay higher salaries and we just have to figure it out. So, um, so that's where my brain goes that it's, it's too popular to let fall. It's going to get, it's going to happen, but it might not happen until really late in the game. So am I, uh, I'm concerned, obviously like my, my primary job in my job is to, is to try to manage the BLM's 
3,500 fire folks, you know, in, in concert with all their local managers, but try to make things, might make things right for the program to make sure that the program, program is successful. We don't do that without bringing in great people and keeping them. And we're not going to do that if this fails. So, uh, you know, I, I have, I have, I have faith in Congress. Can I say that out loud? I have faith <laughs> in Congress that they're going to make this happen. It is truly bipartisan. It is truly a no lose situation. Uh, some they're going to figure it out. It's laid out before them. They know exactly what they need to do. And every congressperson I talk to, I don't talk to that many, but the ones I talk to is recognize that they need to make it happen. That bill was a flash in the pan and they need to do something permanently. Um, so I, I think it will. They need to do it right though. And if they don't do it without the input of the wildland firefighters, the boots on the ground, it's going to fall flat on its face. Yeah. People are going to be pissed. Right. So, and, and, you know, there's a proposal out there that, that is a sliding scale for, for GS, you know, threes through fifteens. And it does not look exactly like what um, has been happening in bill. And it's a combination of, of portal to portal pay and, and base rate pay. And it, and it definitely, um, is tilted towards the lower grades, towards the boots on the ground, more so than it is to higher graded managers. Which so is good for recruitment and, and mid-level and, retention. And I, and it's honoring what Congress said they initially wanted to do, which was pay firefighters more. And they didn't necessarily, I, not to, not to, because I am a fire manager, they didn't say pay fire managers more. They said, we want to pay firefighters more. And so this proposal that's gone forward is reflective of that because it, 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 for the lower grades, it, it pays them more of an increase than it does for higher grades by percentages. And, uh, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of more in line with what Congress said they wanted to do. Um, there was a lot of scrambling when bill got passed on how to make that happen. And, and I think, you know, people grabbed it at a, a fairly easy solution, the $20,000 or 50%, whichever is less. But, um, this one is a little more, there's a little more math involved. My, my fear is that it, um, is that, I mean, it's great. It's way better than we were, than we had before bill, but people are not going to remember before bill, you know, True. 800 people were probably in our agency or probably new, you know, and they've, this is all they've ever experienced. Right. And so what, we're, what it, the perception is that people are going to see that we're taking something away from them, not that we're giving them something that they didn't have before the infrastructure law. That's my big fear. So people are going to look at it as, as I'm getting less as opposed to um, we're trying to create a permanent solution. Bill was just a temporary solution. And that's a lot, that's a lot for people to grab a hold of. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, you're, you're living on a paycheck and the paycheck goes down. It's like, and some of those people that are going to get less are really key people, you know, doing really tough jobs at the GS 11, 12, 13 level. Uh, you know, I am not, I, I'm, I'm not happy with that myself, you know, because we need those people too, right? It's we not all, all about it. GS3s. We need all of it, right? Yeah. And so I would rather, if I were doing it, I'd rather have just kept doing what we were doing because at least people were happy with that. With the BIL? With, with the BIL, yeah, but, 20, but yeah, it's not the way, it's not the way it queued up. On the plus side, the portal to portal pay we're, th we're talking about um, also applies to everybody who responds to fires, not just, not just the people who are in firefighter retirement coverage. So that has a benefit. For, so including for like everybody. militia. Yes. Okay. Uh, what we call, what we call the militia, right? So. Cause other, it's a paid premium from my understanding, right? Yeah. So it would, it would, it would, it would equate to, to, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks more a day for a lot of folks when they go out there and fight fire. So and the, we need those people to help us. So I love it from that point of view that we're, we're actually rewarding those people a little bit more for sacrificing and going off on large fire assignments for the most part. So that that's a good thing. Yeah. I know that morale is kind of at an all time low across all agencies right now. And it's just because I think people are, are kind of getting disillusioned with what's happening on uh, Capitol Hill. Maybe just, I, I don't know, maybe I, I really don't, I can't really put a word to it, but people are just starting to get like, meh, just over it practically. Right. right. And, um, I, I honestly think that people, cause they're disenfranchised, especially when they're chasing OT hazard, all that stuff all season long. And then they're expected in some places to keep going past their term of appointment. If they're seasonal, sometimes that gets a little bit much, especially if you just cranked out a thousand, 1200 hour, 1200 hour overtime season. And now you're expected to go respond to Santa Ana's in, you know, region five. That's hard. That's all a lot to chew on. Now, the homelessness, we literally have homeless, unemployed veteran wildland firefighters in some areas. And if that was to actually hit the news, like stories like that, I, I don't know if that would ring with, with Congress. It might motivate people to do so. But the morale, I think that people are just... 
they've heard it all before for the past 30 to 40 years. And then all of a sudden in the last three years, we've had a, these monumental changes. So my biggest fear for the agency, because we need both agencies, we need Bureau of Land Management, we need the USDA, we need DOI, all that stuff, right? We need all of these fire agencies to accomplish our missions, right? And it's not just suppression, it's all the folks involved with that. What I'm concerned about is what you just said, and it seems like you share a similar level of concern that if this does not go through and it falls fat, flat on its face, I think that people are honestly going to use this BIL money as a severance package if something doesn't get implemented right away. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I won't argue with you. I think, um, for one, uh, so l let's back up just a little bit. Bill was actually kind of proposed as a, as a retention thing. So yeah. it was, it was really intended to retain people. And so, and so, and so I think it served its purpose in a lot of cases. I mean, I, I personally know folks who've delayed retiring for instance, or quitting because Bill was there. And so, and so, you know, it did, it, it did what it was supposed to do, which was retain folks. And, and if it expires, then it's retained folks for, you know, two years essentially. And, and that's it. Um, our goal is to replace it before it expires so that people um, continue to be retained, uh, you know, if they are motivated by what's in the bill, at least for pay. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I have the same, I have the same concerns that um, people will say, yep, that's, that's it. That's what I expected that people, you know, this was a momentary thing. And now people have moved on to the next issue and there's, then there's no incentive to, to make this thing happen. Uh, I guess I am, I'm more, I'm more confident than I am not confident that um, we will reach a solution. Hopefully before people get so jaded that it's, you know, it's waiting, that we're waiting until the last possible minute. But I, but in all honesty, I mean, I, I'm just frankly, a, try to be plain spoken, which is, you know, people ask me, I say, yep, it's going to run out and we need a solution. And, and when Congress people come into me and ask me, I say, yep, it's going to be a problem. We need this fixed before it runs out. And when firefighters come to me, I say the same thing. So I say the same thing regarding those of the audience. It's like, that's got to get fixed. Um, it's, it's plain as the nose on our faces. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, giving somebody a benefit and then taking it away. We see this in all walks of life in, in the United States, pissed. right. In, in the world. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can go anywhere, you give somebody a benefit and then you take it away. That's why tax breaks are so hard to ever expire. Right. They may, they may have, they may have some time lapse in them, you know, in, in law and you always see Congress walk in and, and extend those time, those tax breaks ad infinitum, right. It's just human nature. It, it is once something's established, as a benefit, it's, it's hard to take it away. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I hope we're not looming towards like a mass attrition event because that would really, really suck. And this is between the two agencies. I think that, uh, this, this is a wonderful job and, but it's got, it's like issues. It's, it's, it's wonderful. I loved it. I miss it to this day. I'm very far. I'm almost five years removed from the game and I miss it every day. All right. However, we need to address the elephant in the room. Yeah. or else we're going to face a mass attrition. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to use that language that you use. Uh, you're free to you're freer to use language than than I am, and I'm also kind of um, what uh, I mean. I fear that I fear that that will be true because you know what um, that just makes sense to me that people will say, ah, this is both a blow to my income and and a sign that this country isn't serious about um, this very important work. Cause, cause it's just fair to pay people, um, a living wage and a living wage is way higher than, it, than, it, than it was. And, and I'll also say there are a lot of other people in the federal sector who are also not making a living wage. So, so it's not just us. We are the beneficiary of the focus on fire, but, but I'll, I'll say there are a lot of, a lot of coworkers out there who, um, do similar work, who aren't getting the same benefit. And I do always want to be mindful that there are a lot of people left out, even in the fire organizations who just aren't in special retirement. So since we're on that subject, let's segue into the elephant in the room. And I know this is going to be one of those ones that, that is- That's two elephants now. How many elephants, elephants are in this room? Well, dispatch this because- room is, This room is getting crowded. <laughs> it is. There's like two over there, yeah, one okay. over there. It's, it's getting crazy in here. But one of the biggest things that is a concern is the exclusion of dispatchers. And that was a huge blow. And if people- people are crawling into my inbox and sending me like nasty grounds. Why isn't grassroots doing this? Why isn't anchor point doing this for the dispatchers? And you know what? Dispatchers are a very real uh, part of this game. If you can't, it's, it's like the military. If you can't shoot, move and communicate, you're going to lose the war. It's, 
pretty, granted, this is not to be compared with warfare. Wildland fire is not war. It's not combat. However, we do derive a lot of our SOPs from the military. We still need to move items logistically. We need to be able to communicate and then we need to be able to be operationally efficient. Now, if one of those things fall, we're done. So if we have a situation to where dispatch is <laughs> and logistics with dispatch specifically being excluded from this uh, presidential budget, that's, that's a problem. I mean, what is going on there? Um, Sorry, the BIL. The BIL, right? Correction. Um, so I'll just say that I have in my organization at NFC, I have 400 employees. Hundreds of those are left out of the bill. They are f direct fire support people, not dispatchers, but direct fire support people who are not in special, special retirement coverage. And they are all left out of the pay supplements and have been since day one. So it is not lost on me that there's a huge, I, I just say 20% of our organization. So six, 700 people um, who are in fire positions who are not covered by special fire retirement coverage and who are left out of the pay supplement and, and will be left out going forward apparently. So, so it's not just dispatchers. It is the whole support organization that uh, exists out there to keep things rolling. And those folks um, have not been included in the bill based on what Congress said about firefighters being the focus of the pay supplement. I mean, that, you know, President Biden came to the fire center and, and announced the $15 an hour thing. And he, you know, was thinking firefighters and people have been thinking firefighters ever since because that's what they hear, you know, hot shots, engine crews, hell attack. Um, but, but I, I feel that there have been a lot of people left out of the discussion, people who are really critical to the, to the fire organization who are not being um, compensated the same way that firefighters are. Um, that is ongoing discussion, but I, you know, haven't been able to influence that. The BLM, our organization has been able to reward those people with some, some pay supplements um, last year and this year, but it's not enough. And, and uh, we, we feel that particularly about dispatch. We've had dispatch problems for a long time, staffing up our dispatch centers. And we've had people in dispatch who are fire covered, essentially, who, who've got, you know, fire line experience on the ground, fire line, fire line experience. And there were people in dispatch centers who do not, and, um, and, and that's by necessity and our workforce is better for it, you know, having, having a folks from a variety of backgrounds. So now we're faced with these kind of two sorts of employees who were in dispatch centers, especially local dispatch centers. It's kind of like divisive almost. It's like the haves and haves not. It is. It is. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. And, uh, and so, you know, we got a couple issues. One is pay issue. Two is what's the future for folks who come into those, those dispatch centers who don't have that fire line experience. Can they progress? Is there a place for them in the organization? But um, particularly for the four or five, six, which is what you, you started with. Um, there was a, there was some uh, ground truthing of, of fire duties that happened last year when they were first looking at the four, five, six series. I, I'm air quoting they, you know, it was people from OPM and uh, other folks who were trying to figure out how to, how to, roll out this new series and they did it in a hurry. You oh, know, yeah. Bureaucracy moves slow. Unless this, they don't have to. And then it's real quick. Yeah. And they had to, and they went really fast. And I think frankly, um, that got missed. That dispatch was an essential function to fire. The whole dispatch element got left out. Um, it's back in the discussion. Um, there are some surveys coming out here next week, I think that, that are going to really try to plumb what exactly the duties are in dispatch. I think people are, honestly trying to find a way to, to fit dispatch back into the four five, six discussion, um, which is a little separate from the pay supplement, but, but at least it's recognizing that dispatch is an inherent function and, uh, inherently stressful, maybe more stressful than other people's jobs really when it comes down to it, oh, yeah. um, with no off switch, right. You, you, you can never, you can never go take five. And, uh, um, so, so I have a feeling that, that, um, dispatch is going to end up back in the four five, six, uh, again, I'm, I'm hopeful about that, but, um, there was recognition that something got missed. So, um, it's all been reengaged. Grassroots was part of that discussion. I know Forest Service was part of that discussion. BLM was part of that discussion about the effects of leaving these people out, um, you know, that are so, so important to, to all of us and that, and that their job is inherently wildfire centric, you know, yeah. they do other things, but so do we all. Um, so there was, there was some miscommunication, I think, and, uh, hopefully we'll write that wrong. 
Yeah, I'm hoping so too. I mean, it's it's not just the dispatchers too. It's your wage grades. It's which now are included. There, it's that there's a lot of confusion on the wage grade side. Yeah, there's so there are a lot of different wage grades. I've got wage grades who do warehouse work, and 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 um, those folks aren't necessarily in fire jobs, but there we have wage grade heavy equipment operators who absolutely are, and so um, they will be included in the pay piece. I'm not sure about the four, five, six in all cases, but. Um, there are going to be plenty of jobs that are fire jobs that are fire covered jobs that are not in the four five, six, but if some aviation jobs, you know, you name it, there's a whole bunch. You don't have to be in the four five, six to be part of the pay solution. You have to be part of firefighter retirement system to be part of the pay solution. Which transitions into the next question that was all of these questions that I'm asking you are crowdsourced. Yep. So, um, these are directly from boots on the ground and some public, um, so with that, I think that's a good segue into whether or not we're going to be moving towards a national fire service or some sort of national fire fighting agency as far as a federal context, in a federal context, I guess. Now, do you support a national fire service? Why or why not? Explain if it's advantageous, if it's a horrible idea. I know that the, this is, these are all, and, and I understand yeah. uh, that the Forest Service mission is completely different with some overlap. Mm -hmm. They're completely different missions to the BLM, right? Now, specifically about fire, wildfire suppression, do you support a national uh, fire service? Uh, I don't, and um, but I but I don't say that lightly. And and uh, I mean, you know, we've been arguing about this for my whole career. Like there have been people it's saying not a it, new topic. It's yeah, not it's been a. This has been talked about for decades. It, it's not a new topic, and typically it's the it's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air quote the fire guys. It's the fire folks who really see um, who see the appeal of it and because they'll, they'll get upset by things like OPM taking two years to figure out dispatch belongs in the four or five, six series, right? Or how come it takes so long to get this to happen? You know, these people are worried about, you know, something else that doesn't have anything to do with me. I want them to worry about fire. And if we had a fire agency, it would be more responsive to my needs as a firefighter. And that's, that's the argument that we should stovepipe this stuff because we don't have anything to do with what the rest of the Bureau does. It's that statement that I just said, we have nothing to do with the, what the rest of the Bureau does that I absolutely dispute because um, we have fire problems because we have fuels issues because we have land management issues. And so we got 250 million acres, you know, give or take that we manage in the BLM. We have fire on that landscape because the landscape supports fire and the fire mission that we have in the Bureau is tied to that landscape that's being burned and that, um, and for which fire is, is a huge change agent. You could, you could supplement forest service for BLM in that sentence and it would be absolutely the same. So you can't separate fire from the fuels. You can't separate the fuels from the land management actions that happen. This to me is why fire belongs in the land management agency, because those two things work together. And what we want to do is actually have the same folks who are managing fire suppression or fire management in the summertime, primarily in the summertime, helping to manage the fuels in the shoulder seasons because they have the experience on, on what fire behavior looks like, on what fuels should look like that they can apply to the fuel situation when they've got time to do it. I mean, that's the marrying of fuels management and, and fire management or fire suppression that, that has been in the program for decades, right? So, I mean, we created the fuels management program because it's mm -hmm. recognition that the best people to do prescribed fire, for instance, are the people who go out and do fire suppression. They light fire. Yeah. They light fire for a living. You know, they fight fire for a living. So those are the great people to do prescribed fire or to plan fuels projects because they're really good at identifying places where we need fuels projects. So that's, that's why fire and fuels are in the same program. And that's why fire and fuels are in the land management agencies because of that tie to the, to the land itself, to the condition of the land. If you make some super agency, super federal agency, for instance, that yeah, has 20 like FEMA or something like yeah, that. The yeah. The FEMA for fire, although FEMA doesn't really have on the ground people, they just borrow people. Yeah. Right. So, but, so this is, a, this would be a whole new, this would be like TSA. This is my example. All right. We're going to do TSA for fire. Maybe I could just <laughs> stop. Right, maybe I could just stop right there. Can I just stop? <laughs> Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> no, I was going to say that's, that's, you want to be, uh, I'm, I have friends in TSA. I don't want to impugn TSA, but I mean, that's, you know, it would look something more like that mm -hmm. where, um, where you would have to have this wildfire agency X sitting in Winnemucca, Nevada, because then, because they'd need to staff Winnemucca, right? This fire agency. And they would, they would set up an outpost in Winnemucca separate from the BLM, maybe across the street from the BLM in some, in some office, and then be responsible for putting fires out on all BLM land. I just don't feel like that agency 
as a as a as a experienced bureaucrat would be responsive to the agency's needs. I, I think that's a kind of monolithic approach that would separate firefighting from land management. And I, I think in the long term that that's exactly opposite of where we need to be. So, so our approach, you know, in the feds at least, is to is to respect agency missions and then to work collegially and collaboratively, which we do incredibly well. And I don't have to tell anybody on this podcast that that you know, there's nothing there's nothing more seamless, frankly, than a team showing up with people from twenty different local, state, federal, county agencies, and all agreeing to the same standards and you know, managing fire the same way and talking the same language. Um, I I. I think we're really good at doing that right there. And, and in fact, we're a stronger organization because we have to do that because we don't, we're not command and control all the way to the top levels. We actually have to get along with people. We have to listen to people and we have to collaborate. And I think when you create this national monolithic federal response agency, you absolutely lose that need to talk to one another. You start ordering people around. You end up with boots on the ground having way, way less ability to influence what happens to them as an organization. I, I flat out believe that. I mean, I'm part of the BLM because it's an incredibly flat organization. You know, I was a firefighter. I've become this assistant director, not that I'm hung up on titles, but you know, I've, I've managed to kind of uh, warm my way up or, <laughs> or fall into, fall into jobs that nobody else wanted, however you want to describe it. And, uh, and that's a great thing. And, uh, and, you know, I get calls from people on the ground who say, you know, this is screwed up. And, and so I think that availability of folks who can maybe try to help influence things is a great thing. I just, I just fear that this national fire service would not, would neither serve the land or the people very well, nor do I think it would serve firefighters very well. Is, even though it looks like on the surface, like, oh man, they would really just jump and they would be responsive, whoever they are. I, I feel like we would lose, we, we, the Royal, we, all of us in the fire, in the fire agencies would lose in the long run. I mean, I got frustrations like everybody else yeah. having to deal with bureaucracies and competing priorities. That's called being an adult. And, uh, <laughs> and I find, I find my agency is incredibly responsive to the needs of firefighters. My, my boss and my boss's boss are really good, really smart, really care. They've got other things going on too, but they but they are putting their time and money and effort into protecting grassroots firefighters, grassroots, the other grassroots, the people at the grassroots, like not the yes. organization, but uh, they're they're in the right place, and uh, so I I don't support it. But there you go. I will agree with you that there, the, despite the differences between the BLM and the uh, the Forest Service, I will say that some agencies are a lot better at taking care of the personnel than others. And I'm not going to disparage any one particular agency or another, but I'm pretty sure everybody can get drifted. It's, 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 it's not necessarily they're bad at it. I think that they're just different missions. And I think that also the personnel difference, the amount like sheer numbers and volume of personnel involved with some of these organizations, that's going to be also one of those factors. But my experience with working with the Bureau of Land Management it's, it's a people first organization. It's a boots on the ground first organization. Right. I mean, yeah, it's got its drawbacks, but I tend to favor team yellow, <laughs> if you will. Well, I do too. But, um, and, and I, I love the forest service and I started with the forest service, but, I do. I've worked for but, them as well. but if they're the most bureaucratic and the least responsive to the field and you want to make a super agency where essentially you're going to take the forest service model and, and grow it even bigger, I'm, I'm not sure that that is a solution. I, I think one thing that happens right now and, and, you know, forest service is great at this. And, and so are we, we, there's a healthy competition, right? And oh, so, yeah. and, and that's where you get grade creep, all those things that as managers, we, we're supposed to not like, but, you know, we'll offer more than the forest service because we want to steal forest service employees and they'll try to do it back. And uh, that's a good thing. It's like, we are in competition with one another in a healthy way. Like, oh, you know, you know what they're doing? They're doing that. That makes perfect sense. And the forest service does it all the time. It's like, holy crap, how did they get away with that? How come we can't do that? And we will try to pursue it. So I think there's part of that. If you've got one monolithic agency, you're not going to have that. You're not going to have competition among the agencies trying to make lives better for, for, for their employees because they're, because frankly, they're trying to steal them. Mm -hmm. Um, so just that alone, that competition among the agencies is reason enough to keep it, to keep it dispersed because, uh, Cause yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of benefit there to having people, you know, do things independently, figure things out for themselves and, and offer it up to their partners. Um, that's how we progress. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. If you just had Ford and no GM cars would be a lot crappier. Yes, they would. And 
I'm kind of torn on this whole subject about a national fire agency because of exactly what you just said. Mm-hmm. Like thinking about it in the, uh, the, the grand scheme of things. Yeah. You could solve a lot of these problems with some agreements or m- memorandums of understanding or whatever you want to throw out there. Right. But in reality is adding more bureauc- bureaucrat style stuff, like bu- more bureaucracy. Is that really the answer? Cause we may end up getting that, especially if it's managed by a bigger department, say like department of Homeland security or something right. like that. Right. So it's going to come with the good or the bad, but I'm kind of indifferent to either way. I, yeah. I just don't understand the the pros and cons. You hear, you hear a lot because I'm at the fire center and we have five different agen- major agencies mm-hmm. there doing stuff. And they say, well, why do you need five different agencies? Why do you, you know, why is there a fish person and a BLM person and a, and a BIA person? Why don't you just have one person? Because if you had one agency, you would need a, you would need a national fire service slash BIA person to deal with the BIA. You would need a, National Fire Service, Fish and Wildlife Service person to deal with the Fish and Wildlife Service. You would need you would need the exact same organization. You would just be telling you would be telling you would be calling them something different, right? So you would have the same bureau, you'd have the same bureaucracy even more, mm-hmm. uh, because you would need the same number of people really to manage it. Because because frankly, the same person can't be managing all of fires on BLM who's managing tribal interests specific to to the BIA program. Um, so I think a lot of, a lot of the, you know, the quote efficiencies that people see are really illusory because you would, you would need the same sorts of staff, just, they'd just be working for, you know, a single, a single boss, some cabinet level person who may or may not have the interests of firefighters at heart. You know, if it's something like, something like a FEMA model, uh, I'm just not sure that firefighters would see a, a better representation of their interests up at that level in that kind of bureaucracy. But, uh, you know, it may happen to us. Somebody may tell us to do it. And, uh, and I guess we'll see, but, uh, cause I do, I hear the same conversation and I, and I know there are people who, who lobby for it. I just, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot and there's a lot of complexity and nuance with this and there's no like silver bullet or one size fits all solution for any of the problems that we have across the United States, particular to wildland firefighting or fuels management or whatever. But it's little chunks at a time, I think is going to be like right. the best way to fix it. Right. Progress, it progress is incremental. Absolutely. We shouldn't, shouldn't expect, um, whole hog solutions overnight. I, oh yeah. And it's, it's like, uh, like the state agencies, and the private contractor world and all these other cooperators that work with us on federal incidents. And there we've had some detractors with the efforts from grassroots, not the grassroots firefighters, but the grassroots wildland firefighters, the organization um, saying like, well, what about contractors? What about state? It's, it's not our mission. One, we're very specific and very keyed into one particular element of what we're trying to change. Right. And that's federal wildland fire, fire, firefighting. Now, you even kind of alluded to it yourself in that previous conversation with the fact that a rising tide will raise all shifts, just like the forest service and the Bureau of land management is competing each other for stealing each other's employees. Well, now if the agencies and the federal government side set the standard, then everybody naturally has to go, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. So potentially I, you know, potentially. Yeah. And I'm from Idaho and I, I don't see, Idaho Department of Lands competing with the federal pay scale, but um, maybe, but they will, they've always been below. And so they probably always will, but, uh, but maybe not always, but, but um, they, you know, in effect, they become the minor leagues, the feeder crew. Um, that's, that's been the case for Idaho Department of Lands for, for some time for folks who wanted to move for higher pay, they would have to get out of IDL and move into some other agency. Uh, it depends on the state, you know, uh, some states outcompete us. I don't think that necessarily means that everybody from the fed side will, will automatically go work for Cal fire or, or Washington the same way. Those IDL folks won't automatically come to work for us because we pay more, but, uh, it's definitely creates a tension in the system. And I, and I think you, I think you're right. There will be economic pressure on those other agencies to, to raise their pay. And, and it has been felt even in Idaho, which is, which is a, a pretty, um, a pretty, uh, how to describe it they're, they're pretty bullish on, on pay generally just for, for state employees. Um, but they're having to catch up too, because you know, the world's an expensive place these days. And that it is my friend. All right. So topic and concern number two. So we have a problem affecting the workforce with mental health, substance abuse, and suicide. This problem is indiscriminate to agency, department, race, gender, rank, region, or any other demographic. And many will argue that it has entered a mental health state of crisis. 
what is being done to assist the boots on the ground with this other, I'm going to use this term again, elephant in the room mm. issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the mental health crisis, uh, I mean, is the, are the agencies aware of the issues that are just running rampant within our ranks? Um, I know it's hard to say because so, so you, yeah, you have to, how do you define that? So with, without issues? endorsing all the language you use, I'd say, yes. So, um, but, um, so for one, let's, let's, let's dissect this a little bit. Um, we have, you know, by tradition, a culture that maybe has not been as open to asking for, you know, individuals less, less interested in asking for assistance than they might otherwise. And that's definitely a cultural thing. That's a cultural thing. I, I hate to just throw out stereotypes and, and just, you know, it's a stereotype for a reason true. though. That's a thing. Yeah, maybe uh, let's say it's true uh, because, because I think in a lot of these cases, you can just, you can act as if it's true because it, because even if it's, even if it's only partly true, you might as well act that way. Suicide is a great example. We don't have really good data on suicide rates among wildland firefighters. Cause we get lumped in we, wildland fire tends to get lumped in with um, other fire or people who sometimes respond to wildland fire. And so the numbers tend to get conflated and it's really hard to know. Um, I have a person, Patty, Dr. Patty O'Brien on my staff yeah. who's amazing. And she's done, you know, as much work on this as anybody else. And, uh, and I'll just put a plug in for more science that we need. We need to know a lot more about our firefighting workforce and I, and I'm going to say firefighting in the broadest sense, let's include dispatchers, everybody in the organization, because we know the stresses of the job apply to everybody, but, um, we need to know a lot more so that we can intervene in the way that we want to intervene, you know, my, being mindful of, of, um, individual differences. But, but I think we need, we need frankly more data to back up the kind of stuff you just said. So suicide rates, for instance, among wildland fire, they get conflated with, with other, wildland responders who might be EMTs, might be urban departments who see much different stuff, frankly, than we do in the wildland fire community. Mm -hmm. We go through trauma different from the typical trauma that, um, say, somebody in an urban wildland fire, uh, wildland fire, in an urban fire department might see, for instance, oh, yeah. coming upon 100%. accident scenes, right? Yeah. So, so there is a difference there. And so I think when we, we talk about interventions, we want to be, want to be confident that, you know, the data is good, but, but the data is what it is. Patty has seen that, you know, we look a lot like, um, our demographic. Um, and, and so our demographic, you know, we're 80%, 80% white male, let's just say it, you know, for, it for whatever it is, yeah. it's something like that. Right. Yeah. And if you look at, if you look at, um, our age group, our age group, no, I'm not in that age group anymore, but if I were, <laughs> that'd be me. So if you look at, if you look at, at, um, the cohort that you really want to compare to, it'd be 20 to 50 year old white males who live in the West, who, um, enjoy outdoor pursuits, maybe own a gun, blah, blah, blah. They're, that's a different cohort from just the general population and right. The American More population. Specific breed of people. Totally. And when you, yeah. and so when you start making comparisons about substance abuse, about suicide rates, about suicide ideation, um, all this kind of stuff, you should, you should first say, well, what exactly who are we comparing to? Because comparing to grandma, comparing to binge drinking between grandma, and there is no, comparison. there is no comparison, right? Yeah. Grandma doesn't binge drink. So, so first off, I think we want to say, all right, how much different from the normal, that normal demographic are we? And, and then let's assume that we are different that we have specific stresses that are, that are, that are leading folks to, to substance abuse, to alcohol abuse, to, to, um, suicidal thoughts. Let's act as if that's true. But I think the data the data aren't as crazy high as sometimes are portrayed that, that, um, suicide for instance is a great example. It's like how, you know, personally I've had, you know, a couple folks in my organization, um, kill themselves and, you know, one is too many, but, I, but I think we do want to be careful about, about, um, portraying problems in the proper way. So that's, that's just my introduction. So, um, we know we have high rates of binge drinking. We have high rates of alcohol use. We have, High, higher than we need rates of suicidal thoughts of, of suicidal attempts. Um, are they outrageous compared to the t total demographic that we're, we should be compared to? Maybe not, but, um, but we, we don't know, know at the same time. And we know that that age group, that that 20 to 50 year old white male living in the West with a gun is the most at risk has, a, has a super high suicide rate. So, so we might just look like the other folks in similar professions out in the West, um, but, but it might not necessarily be the wildland fire that's doing it. Maybe, um, the people who are attracted to wildland fire also have those tendencies. So it's like chicken and egg kind of stuff. So 
so what are, what are we doing? We got to acknowledge one that that is so that that um, that that tendency is high in that demographic in our firefighters, in our veteran firefighters. Mm-hmm. Um, we have specific stressors that that are um, greater than other people experience. The the risk of fire, the it's, you know risk of burnover, the um, bad things that happen to our friends. Um, the risk of bad things happening to our friends, the time away from family, the time away from home, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have all those stressors. So absolutely. Do we need to intervene? Absolutely. Have we been? Yes, we have. We've been working, uh, post-traumatic stuff really well for, for a while, right? SISM kind of interventions, critical mm-hmm. incident stress management. We have people who do that. We have contractors who help us. We have people. I want to say that the Bureau of Land Management has pretty much been a pioneer in that I want to say. Um, Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'll put a plug in for the three folks who have gotten us where we are. And Nelda St. Clair, who was really kicked us off. Shout out to Nelda. Um, Bodie Ronk. And then uh, Patty O'Brien, who's, who's, you know, licensed uh, clinical uh, psychologist and, and also a firefighter or former firefighter. So, um, so great work by all those folks to get us where we are now. And, And especially in the trauma side of things, when bad things happen, the, the part that it took longer to get to was getting to people before, before the trauma happens and give them the tools to deal with stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and stuff could be, stuff could be trauma or stuff could be just going off on your own for the winter because you've been cut loose from your work and, and your, and your peers oh, the, and your that partners. That is the worst time of year is sitting idle and going from 120 miles an hour, one direction to practically reverse. It's hard. And it gets worse every season for me at least. And I don't know about you, but the people I know who've killed themselves have killed themselves in the for the most part in the off season, right? Yeah. And, and it's not, it's not in season when it happens. And so that, that is a particular stressor where your mission has disappeared. I don't know if you're a special forces, you know, your mission doesn't disappear in, in October. You're, all, yeah, you're training for the next you're cycle. You're training for the next cycle. Right. So, so we cut loose people and, uh, and we leave them to their own devices and maybe we check in on them, but, but traditionally we haven't. And then we just expect them to show up back in the spring. Um, you know, we need to be way more mindful of what happens when, when the fire bell stops going off. Um, so, so uh, that's all great. We're doing, we're doing more resilience work with folks. We're having people go out and visit every firefighter in their stations and talk about issues, open up issues, um, destigmatize seeking mental health. I mean, we know that we know that kids these days, I'm going to say kids these days, but we know that young folks coming into this, coming into the workforce these days have different expectations of mental health investments. I mean, hell, my kids in high school have daily mental health check-ins. They've got counselors. They've got suicide prevention materials. I mean, mental yeah, health. Yeah, I had none of that shit when I was growing up. <laughs> the mental health crisis is not ours. The mental health crisis is the world's and the True. mental health crisis is America's. I mean, we have incredibly high suicide rates compared to where we were before across the board. So we're part of it and we have stressors that we need to deal with, but we're part of a bigger trend, which is which is critical mental health issues across across the across the culture. Um, but people come in with an expectations that we're going to talk about it. Perfect. People that come in with the expectations that we're going to, we're going to help them take care of it. We're going to, you know, provide services where it's, where it's, where it's appropriate or provide insurance where they can, you know, get their own counselor and, and, you know, be portable and, and take care of themselves. You know, all of the above kind of approach is really what we're after. The infrastructure log has given us an opportunity to have more discussions about making a bigger investment in that, in that piece of the program. Um, I wrote some of that. Actually, well, good, good, <laughs> good job. So, uh, unfortunately we haven't funded it all yet, but, um, but, it's, uh, yeah. but we're making, we're making a better effort to provide better services across the industry. I'll just say the, you know, the industry, the forest service, the, the DOI agencies, BLM's been on the forefront, a lot of that stuff, proud to be there. Don't want to slow down. I think this is one of those cases where we want to keep pushing the envelope and, and keep listening to the field and, and hearing from folks what's working, what's not, what they want to see more of, what they want to see less of. Patty's done a lot of that, of pulling folks to say, hey, I've got all these ideas about things I should do as a specialist for the BLM. What do you think I should do? Um, so she's going to do more of that um, to really get a feel for for people that we don't necessarily like. I don't I don't really understand your basic 25 year old. I mean, I, you know, I admit freely that I don't. So I want to hear from those guys. All right. What do you, what do you want? Um, what do you expect? Knowing also that it's not for everybody. It's yeah. like, we're not going to put everybody through mandatory blah, blah, blah. Cause that's the first way to kill a program is to make it one make size it, fits yeah. all and make it cheesy and make it a requirement or death by PowerPoint, death, which death, everybody death by PowerPoint. Yeah. I don't want to do that to people. No. It's like, we want to make it meaningful and make it useful. And if it's not, then we shouldn't do it. So um, I'm not into window dressing. It's like, it's gotta be real. It's gotta be beneficial. The way to do that is really to 
meet people where they are, hear what they hear, what their ideas are and invest in it. Um, that's been a great model for us in the BLM and we're going to keep pushing it. And that's another thing too. It's just like that you, you, you said it right there. It's like, there's no one size fits all, fits all solution for this. There's no silver bullet for this, right? It's just like our fuels problem and our suppression stuff, right? The, all that stuff. There's not a one size fits all solution for that. And it's, it's human nature in human nature is in, inherently complex. But, but, right? but let me say this, there is, there is, there is some universal solution that I'm going to, that I'm going to propose. Oh, shoot one, away, man. Go well, ahead. Okay. Pay people better. Cause what do we know that one of the prime stressors in life is finances. not having enough money, right? I so, said it, I got out of it because of finances. There you go. <laughs> All right. One of pay the people better, give them benefits. So they don't have to worry about, you know, how they're going to pay their medical bills and they're going to be taken care of and You're give around. them and give them a career. So let them work longer if they want to let them work longer so that they, you know, they know that they're going to be taken care of. They get a paycheck coming in. So more career opportunities, more permanent jobs and, you know, better benefits. So, so health benefits that don't go away in the, in the wintertime, like they have in the past for our temporary employees. Yes. And then, yes, and I then, want you to expand on that one. And then know that they have a job in the spring that they don't have to reapply and just hope that they get picked up again. So um, let's take care of some of those stressors. And then finally, Let's make it possible that people don't have to take every fire assignment, that we have enough bandwidth out there that people can turn some assignments down, go to a party, go to, go to take the boat out, you know, do go whatever the, the hell they need soccer to do. soccer or football game. Do that. Uh, all the above, right? Um, so let's make life uh, more, more part of, you know, being a wildland firefighter shouldn't be who you are. It should be what you do. And uh, it should make, it should contribute to who you are as a person, right? It helps make you, but it isn't you. And so, uh, th I mean, that's really the goal is that it's not all consuming, that people can actually have a life outside of their job. Uh, it seems crazy, but uh, I think we can achieve that piece. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's a, it, it, and yeah, you said it perfectly right there. I mean, that, that financial stress and all the other things, it's more complex than just throwing money at a problem. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Now, if you were to appropriate some of these funds to, you know, paying people to where they don't have to worry so much about their finances or where they're going to get their next meal from in the winter. and also the long-term benefits. I'm not talking about like temp buyback, if that's going to be a thing ever. I know it's not a part of the BIL and it may or may not be included in the upcoming presidential budget talks. That's a different subject though. Um, all of these things, the mental health programs too, like it's something as simple as insurance for a temporary seasonal through the winter, that would have changed my entire life as a seasonal when I was coming up through the ranks. Did you opt in when you were a temp? Uh, before I was ineligible cause it didn't exist, but mm. a little bit longer in my career, it was uh, right. available. So, right. right. So that's a fairly recent development. When I was a temp, it didn't exist that yeah. you could even buy into, into, into health insurance. You don't get, you don't buy into retirement, but you can buy into health insurance. Yep. The, the downside of that for a temp is that you, you have to pay, pay both, <laughs> you have to pay both portions in the winter time. Um, and frankly, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stereotype people, but Folks who are less than, you know, younger than 26 in Obamacare, you, you can be on your parents' health insurance. So sometimes people don't opt in. I forget what our rate is for opting in. It's not very high. It can't be very high. Yeah, it's not very high because people don't, frankly, don't see the benefit to it, right? Um, so they they won't opt into the health insurance because, you know, by the time you sign up, you know, your season's, you know, halfway over or something like that. So I can only imagine, but it is, but it is out there. What would be better is if um, they didn't have to pay the employee uh, or the employer portion in the wintertime when they're laid off. Uh, kind of like setting it up to where it's like a, the perm seasonals. So they just pay their double portion yes, when they come and then back get, on. And then get paid back. Yeah. Yes. Um, we don't, we don't have that ability right now. We just I wish we did know, fairly recently. We got the ability to even keep them on the rolls for, for health and, or put them on the rolls for health insurance and all, um, you know, the better option, which is what we are pursuing, um, is making people not be temps. So let's get rid of temps. Um, now people like being temporary sometimes because they're going to school because you know blah blah blah. I only want to work so many months. Uh, I think one thing that is within our control is um, the terms of a of a career seasonal appointment, right? So typically in the BLM we've done thirteen, yeah, thirteen and thirteens. We've done you know six months in a day, uh, so you're guaranteed six months a day as a WAE. We call them mm -hmm. while actually employed. Um, so so our appointments have always been six months, no shorter. Uh, we need to pursue shorter, shorter appointments so that people can, you know, come in as a career seasonal appointment, come in for a shorter period of time and, and lay off and go to school, for instance. I, th I think that would be a better option than having people be temps. But ultimately, one of the goals from 2019 on, what we've been doing is trying to say we need fewer temps, 
and way more career seasonal and way more PFT people. We need uh, 80% of our workforce to be either career seasonal or permanent full-time, and then 20% of our workforce be temps. So we give way more of our people um, solidity. We give them, we give them benefits that carry over. We give them retirement benefits, you know, if they want them, um, and, and stop hiring people over and over again into temps. Uh, it's not the appropriate, it's not the appropriate hiring mechanism for the, for the, for the work we have, frankly, it's just like, it's an old model. So we're trying to it's get antiquated. It. Yeah. It's antiquated. And we've been, we've been pushing that way. Um, there's still, there's still always going to be plays for temps. You know, it's, it's more nimble, People can get their foot in the door and try it out and see if they like it, all that kind of thing. But um, we think we have way too many of them. And that has been a conscious investment on the parts of really of, of Congress and, and the administrations to, to transform our workforce into a more permanent workforce. That is not bill related. That is that is normal. independent. Yeah, that is independent. We've been working on it for a while. We were, same way we were working on making every engine captain in the BLM GS8. The same way we said every engine captain should be offered permanent full time status if they want it. Every GS8 in the hotshot ranks. Every GS9 in the hotshot ranks for sure should be offered permanent full time status. Every GS8 in the bureau, if we've got meaningful work for them, should be offered the opportunity to be permanent. We haven't got there. Some people frankly don't want it. And that's, you know, 18 and eight is my cap. Totally. Yeah. And that's all well and good, but for folks who want it, we should offer it. Um, and we're still working that. I'm still, I still, we're still offering our pilots, their GS 12s. We're still offering them permanent full-time status. Not sure if they're going to take us up on it, but, uh, that should be, that should be an expectation of employees when they reach a certain point that if they want to be permanent year round, they can be. That's a good thing. I think that's a pushing it towards like a, a, a better future for all of us, quite frankly. Absolutely. Um, so going back to the mental health thing, so the BLL, BIL, BLM, geez, I can't talk right now. The BIL, uh, provided a bunch of funding to research and development and improvement of mental health programs across all agencies. Uh, what's something new that the BLM will be implementing with these funds? And we mentioned earlier that we didn't have a lot of data. Is there any funding going to the data to, uh, these mental health, uh, studies? The, um, there is effort going into the data. So there, there are a couple couple different groups that are interested in, in exploring mental health and really pushing the envelope on that. One of them, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even go into it, but it doesn't require necessarily money. It's just effort. Um, and even our joint fire science program that we have at the fire center is getting more into firefighter health and wellness. And, and let's just, let's just broaden it out to say firefighter health and wellness, mental health being a key part of it. But uh, we have a whole bunch of other things we need to understand about firefighters. It's much more than just the mental health component. Totally. Oh, yeah. uh, we want a better, better. Um, it, it's one of your questions. We need a better foundation for how we do work rest, you know, and how we do, how we do tours. Uh, mm -hmm. We need better nutrition foundations. We need better, all sorts of better data on, on how this life drives you into the ground or doesn't, you know, because we, we don't frankly know a lot of it. Um, we don't know a lot about smoke exposure, frankly, we mm -hmm. should know more. It's hard to do. It's hard to, it's hard to figure. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of new emphasis on that or renewed emphasis on that and, and more organized emphasis on firefighter health and wellness of all sorts. Uh, in the infrastructure law, the forest service took some of that money and used it for investments in mental health on the DOI side. Um, we were actually instructed not to, um, not to use bill funds for that. And so we carved out some other funds. So for instance, uh, Dr. Patty, um, we have a whole little department at our, at our bureau that's now funded out of these new, out of these funds that are designated for mental health and wellness. Um, uh, the new piece that, uh, we've also funded at the DOI level that hasn't been stood up yet is, is a trauma services contract for the, for the back end of when back, bad things happen after schism is over and people need follow on care. Yeah. People, stuff. people, their families. Um, so, so, um, that has not been let yet. That contract has not been yet yet, but it's, it's kind of the thing that, uh, people have found that employee EAP, those kinds of services, that longer term services that are your typical government services don't necessarily do that well. So, um, so that is a new thing that, that will be funded by some of this money we set aside, but it's not infrastructure money per se. And then in the president's budget is this whole new $10 million investment on the DOI side, uh, just on the DOI side, another 10 million on the forest service side to make more permanent, uh, kind of a, a mental health program. Um, the kind of like with the transition into aspire from the previous EAP program. Um, yeah. So aspire is there and aspire always exists and, and people can take it, take up, you know, use its services. Sometimes EAP or aspire works for people. Sometimes it doesn't. It's oftentimes underutilized though. 
Uh, it is, and they and there are all sorts of services they offer. They're, they also limit to how many times you can use those services before you have to transition to your own uh, your own health services, right? Your, mm -hmm. your own, like if you find a counselor through through EAP that you that you like, um, I think you only get so many visits, and then you have to transition to your own insurance, which is not the end of the world, but you have to have insurance to do that. Yeah. So, um, so th there'll be there'll be this ten million dollars uh, in the president's budget for uh, a, more of a, a firefighter mental health program. There was a summit last week that the DOI and the Forest Service hosted to really um, figure out what that program should look like, what people think they wanted from that program, and that kind of scoping is still out there. Again, we're waiting for that piece. We're waiting for Congress to act on that to get to give us the funding to do that. But um, regardless, you know, the BLM's charging ahead and investing in our people to really um, help the Bureau bring services to folks at the ground level, at the district level. And that's, that's really Dr. Patty's job. And that's another thing too. I think there's a lot of data component that could be pulled out of programs like this, because if we don't know how are we going to direct an agency into bettering the boots on the ground, if we don't know the data, I mean, right. historically we haven't kept track of it. You even said that, but now we're just now starting. It's yeah, it's kind of anecdotal still. Yeah, and, it's and all anecdotal. It's people, all it. it's people calling in and saying this and that. And, you know, some of the best data on, on suicide is from CDC, right? And there's like, well, you know, where where is there good data that we can plumb? So, you know, Patty's got some of the best data. I think there's some other folks out there who have some data. I think we need a more concerted effort to really know what we're shooting at. I mean, it shouldn't stop us from getting started, but... Um, but I'm into, into measuring performance, right? And it's like, you, you can't do that without knowing what you're shooting at. And uh, you, Devil's you, in the details. I, totally. And you, how do you know you're succeeding if you, if you actually don't know what your measures of success are? So that's a challenge. That's a good one right there. That's, that's huge right there. You got to know what your goals are and you got to have the data to back it up, right? Totally. So we'll see where it goes. So number three topic and concern, and this is going to be uh, going toward the tail end of the episode mm -hmm. here. So I know you got to get out of here pretty soon. Um, so number three topic and concern is operational changes, concerns, and suggestions. So, so these are some of the issues that, uh, and concerns that the boots on the ground have brought up when it comes to being able to effectively accomplish their mission with suppression and fuels management. And at the top of that list, there's a lot of questions about aviation. Hmm. So where do you see the BLM aviation programs changing in the, changing the most in the next 10 years? Uh, well, I see... Um, the biggest change is going to be UAS is going to be, um, how the DOI, uh, pushes forward and especially the, the BLM pushes forward with UAS. Um, we know that, that, um, we don't call them drones anymore. So, so uncrewed air, uncrewed aircraft is the, is the current term, right? So uncrewed aircraft are going to take on a bigger and bigger workload for the, for the Bureau and, and in fire to some degree. Um, we're not going to replace, you know, all all staffed aircraft with, with unstaffed, but, um, they're going to do a lot, we're going to do a lot more burning with, you know, PSD, PSD machine drones. And, uh, and we have a lot more, um, high, let's see, high capability aircraft out there in the UAS world. We're driving towards a new kind of, uh, uncrewed aircraft, not the, not the cheap throwaway, you know, ones that we had before, but they're going to, they're going to stay in the air longer. They're going to have more capacity. They're going to have more capabilities, they're going to require different skills from the people who operate them. So it looks more like an aircraft and less like a toy. So the people who are flying drones on fires and on resource projects are going to be highly skilled. They're going to be pilots and they're going to know what they're doing. So they don't crash into people, don't crash into other aircraft, right? It's, it's, it's a profession. It is not a, it's not a hobby. You need a license. This you is got your part 107 this, for a reason. That's right. This is not your, uh, this is not your, your, um, you know, your mall drone that you're going to fly around the living room. So, so it's going to take a whole nother level of commitment from the Bureau to train folks. And, and we've got, we've got a uh, UAS specialist in, on my shop, my aviation shop who are working on this stuff. So a plan for how we train people, how we keep them current, where, where pilots are located in the organization and what their job duties are. UAS is going to be part of the 456 series. So it's going to be like a UAS pilot is going to be part of that series. Uh, you know, our, our ideal is really, um, you know, we probably have some dedicated program folks at the state level who help manage um, drone usage within states for mm -hmm. resource work and for firework. There's there's way more potential, frankly, in the on the resource side of the house than there is in the fire side of the house for for drones. And there are also alternatives 
to, to use in UAS. It's not the answer for everything. No, but there's a time and a place. And I don't think time, you'll time. ever remove the human element from fire. I, and frankly, we've got, we've got satellites that can do what some people think they need UAS to do. Right. So there's, there's, or there's data out there already, but yeah. regardless, we need, we need specialists who are going to manage this stuff at the regional level, all the, all the drone usage. We need fire teams who can go out and do the things like burning out, you know, division D. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to be a, a set of skills that is going to be in high demand. And, and frankly, cross-training some folks to do that stuff has been a good model. And we, we see that continuing to some degree, mm -hmm. but uh, it's hard to be a hotshot soup and to be a drone pilot at the same time. You got to be one or the other. So um, we're going to have to get more specialized, but that's, that's the big investment I see is both in aircraft and the people to pilot them and the people to keep them organized. Gotcha. And now second question to that, I guess, is uh, the contracting issues that we've been having. I know this is more of a forest service kind of question as far as the contracting for uh, and it, it may have changed since the last time I've looked into the topic. So forgive me if this is an old question, but I know understand there was some issues with light and medium ship availability for CWNs and exclusive use. And I, I, I really don't know the ins and outs of this one, but as far as your knowledge, how could you explain that to address some of the concerns for the boots on the ground, especially the aviation folks? Um, what was well, it? Type one ships. Yeah. Well, so there's, so there's clearly a type one issue. So there, so, so basically, um, let me think, how can we say this? So type twos generally as a, as a class are kind of, they're going to get pushed to the middle. Like there, there are, we're having a challenge keeping some of the older type twos in the air, frankly. And so, and so we all of us are really looking for the new models that are gonna be the aircraft that we have going into the future. The next gen airframe, if you will. We're the next gen, yeah, rotor wing, right? Yeah. So, so in the rotor world, um, you know, the next gen looks really expensive. So <laughs> it's like, all right, how are we how are we gonna get to? What do we want to get to? And and how are we gonna get there? And uh, we got capabilities we need. We need we need solid aircraft that you know people can repel from. For instance, we don't want to be flying in pieces of junk. So. Um, this is, you know, I know you had one of your questions in there about type one aircraft in, in the BLM. We contracted one seven years ago now to, um, to work out of the Boise, uh, airport there and be a, a crewed type one aircraft, which didn't fit in with the forest service policy, but, um, BLM checked out the aircraft that we contracted, thought it was safe, thought it offered capabilities that we wanted to use, contracted it for a five-year cycle. And now we're on our second five-year cycle kind of kind of what we do is um, look for capabilities we want and see if we can do that operation safely, even though it's a type one ship tech, you know, force service doesn't like flying in type one ships for reasons of their own. Yeah. They use type ones for bucket work only. Um, but you'll see state of Colorado, state of California, both of them contracting brand new, you know, civilian versions of Blackhawks, um, super expensive, but I think the industry is headed that way into, into, into bigger investments in aviation. And uh, I think, you know, BLM's trying to keep up with that and recognize that the same old type two ships that we've been using in the past might not always be available to us. We need to start pushing the envelope a little bit. I know the Forest Service thinking the same way, but maybe not quite the same mm -hmm. mindset, but um, we're all looking at the same thing. How do we add capacity, capability effectively uh, at a price we can afford. And if we can't afford it, then we have to ask Congress for money to, to make it happen. Which is never easy. <laughs> well, actually, sometimes aviation is the easiest thing to ask for because what, really? what do people see on the news? You know, yeah, they, they see, they yeah, see retardant crane. drops and sky cranes. Yep. And so yep. sometimes aviation is the big ticket item that people are willing to fund. You know, unfortunately, ahead of firefighter salaries, uh, I wish <laughs> the world were not so. Because uh, you know what? Give me firefighter salaries first. Has whiz, whiz bang toys second. Yeah. Wait, hasn't that always been like the case with congressional spending though? It's like they all want the Tonka trucks and the fancy new toy, but they don't want to take care of the operator. Uh, I, I can't say that. I can't say I, that I out loud, but, that, but uh, so. yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's, it tends to, it tends to be the flashier things that sometimes raise interest and, uh, you know, hopefully firefighter salaries are the flashy thing this time. Mm-hmm. So that answers my question about the, uh, the crew, which I'm not going to mention the uh, name of the crew. Cause you kind of, went around the uh, name of the crew with that type one ship, but it's the only, Oh, one. the Boise crew, the okay, Boise. There we go. All right. I was oh, just yeah. wondering if you're avoiding the no, name it's of the crew not a, it's not a, it's not a mystery. Not and a I, I think they, I think they, they like being on the cutting edge as a yeah. crew. They're I've also with them in the past and they're awesome. They're, they're awesome folks. And they're staffed heavy and uh, you know, they, they have special demands placed on them because they're, oh, yeah. they're really, um, they get to travel a lot more than maybe <laughs> sometimes it is always desirable. I know a good thing, we talk about good things that are happening in the Forest Service. And I was talking to Forest Service Repeller last week, and she was talking about 
um, Forest Service operating essentially, you know, two aircraft out of an airbase, one that can stay home, one that can go hit the road so that people can rotate in between road assignments and home assignments. And I was like, huh, now that's brilliant. You know, we should be doing, how come we're not doing more of that? Yeah. And we talk about a lot about hub and spoke where we, you know, hub people up and uh, allow people more time to work out of their home station, do more IA work from their home unit, as opposed to being on the road all the time. The downside of being the Boise Hell Attack is that, you know, you do have a big road component and, uh, and, and an umbilical cord yeah. stuck to that ship. Yeah. But I've, I've loved that forest service model of, you know, one at home, one on the road and then switch back and forth and you can, you know, tailor, tailor your work assignments to your personal needs. Uh, I love that. So I'm going to steal that and pretend it was mine. There we go. <laughs> All right. So another question that we had in the aviation context is, uh, do we have a national aviation toolbox that everyone has access to? Uh, aviation oversight is significantly diminished in regions where FAO, where there are no FAOs on the org charts. This leaves a ton of liability and accountability on managers to be dialed, which isn't always the case. A one-stop shop for universal required forms and the most current policies would be very beneficial. This is more of a request. Yeah. And we do on the BLM side. Um, so, f you know, a forest aviation officer, which that's the FAO reference, I think. And for us, that's a unit aviation manager. And we have most of those in place. We definitely have, um, state SAMs, we call them state aviation managers in every, in every BLM state. Um, I'll say UAMs, we tend to have unit aviation managers in places where we have a, a, a sizable enough aviation workload to warrant it. Like so Eastern we, Nevada? Yeah. So yeah. we don't have, we don't have, we don't have vacancies where, not to my aware, awareness that, um, let's think, we don't have vacancies where we need people. We might have vacancies where we figured we, we can cover it some other way, right? So some places aviation can be a, a collateral duty. But, um, but where we need one, we invest in one. And, and when I talked about filling all these support roles better now, I, that's been part of the great thing that's been happening with new money from Congress. We've been able to target specific things in the Bureau that we haven't been able to fund in the past, like um, air tanker bases, which sounds silly, but we, we're always staffing up air tanker bases especially seat bases with, with folks who were just coming on as ADs, as emergency hires and not investing in actual, actual uh, government employees, BLM employees to come and manage something that's really critical. Yeah. You're loading an aircraft and you're making sure it's loaded right. You're making sure it's safe to operate and fly and drop retardant. And we're dropping $70 million worth of retardant every year. Maybe we should invest in a person to actually staff that base on a full-time basis and not uh, not just do it with, you know, whomever we can find, not, not to disparage our AD workforce, but I started out as an AD. It's I, a did, great program. I did too. So I'm, I'm with you, but, uh, but you know, it's we've got a long term solution. No, we got to put our money where, where our mouth is and use an AD for flex time, but uh, we got to invest in our air tanker bases. And, and that's the same with UAMs. We've got to fill out the support organizations and, and we've been doing a lot of that stuff. Okay, good. All right. So moving on to fuels. So we kind of brushed on this earlier. Um, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse with this one, but how do they plan to bolster fuels programs, meet new objectives and existing objectives without overburdening fire employee, fire employees who have already worked a thousand hour season. Now, now this is bordering on two things, the target goals for fuels management and two, addressing our workforce uh, concerns with the burnout and the too many hours, especially that whole thousand hour, 1200 hour season. And then you're asked to go, you know, IA in SoCal for Santa Ana season. Right. Right. And then do fuels management in the uh, off season. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, sometimes this, you probably have a lot of forest service folks on this, on this call. And yeah. I, and I know the forest service is in a different place than we are. And I know they're talking more about mobilizing for um, large scale burning on some of their priority areas. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and I think some BLM folks, some other DOI folks will probably get um, not roped into that, but, but they'll be, they'll be, uh, you know, allowed to participate in that kind of thing based on um, some work we're doing at the bureau levels, at the higher levels to pool some funds. So that for instance, if a forest service has a burn going on, and they want to borrow some folks from a neighboring BLM unit. They don't have to figure out how to pay them. That there is a pool of funding that we can dip into that they can just go without asking questions. So That's, more of a, a ease of operations as far as like mutual assistance yeah, there between make, the Forest to, Service and BLM to make prescribed prescribed fire particularly. I'm talking not fuels work generally, but prescribed fire more like suppression, and that you just. You just go and you've got a code that you can use that's kind of preordained and you don't have to, you don't have to work out an agreement. And we always have neighborhood agreements like that where people can just go help their neighbors, but this would formalize it. Um, 
that's that's a good thing. That's a great thing for the Forest Service, especially um, and say mm-hmm. fish or parks who do more large scale burning than than we do typically in the BLM. Uh, not that we don't do any, but but it's it's more them. And uh, so th- so that's a great thing to make things easier. The downside of that is if it's too easy, then people will start ordering folks from all across the country, and we'll have what you describe, which is. Uh, yeah, you worked, you know, four months straight on suppression and now you're going to work another six weeks traveling around doing prescribed fire. Not the life we foresee for our firefighters who need a break, but people who want to do that, we could make it easier for them to do it. You know, it, it, to each his own. Sometimes people really want to go out and do more work in the older season. Sometimes people don't. And sometimes people want a little and not a lot. Um, we've got to make room for all that stuff if we can, because that'll be efficient and help the Forest Service achieve some big goals. So that's a good thing. On our side, on the BLM side, 70% of our fuels work, and we're looking to treat 1.3 million acres this year, 70% of our work is handled by agreements or grants or contracts. So we are not, um, we're not that same model. We're not necessarily that same force account model that that the Forest Service can be for these large scale burns. Um, we, d- we do a lot more work with other, with kind of other mechanisms and it's not necessarily just people out, you know, lighting fires. Yeah. So, um, so it's a different workload for us typically, but, um, but you know, my goal as a, as a, as a manager is to try to make resources available to folks so that there's enough fuels work locally that people can do it if, they, if they've got the time and got the bandwidth and there's the need in Ely, Nevada, you can, you're done with your engine, you know, you're putting, putting it away for the winter. Um, you can go help write some, write some burn plans or go, you know, work on a contract fencing. or go do a site inspection <laughs> or go do fencing or go paint a, go paint a, you know, whatever it is, uh, GIS, yep. uh, you know, there's all sorts of work out there, but, um, but we want to have enough fuel support out there across the world so that people can, can be gainfully employed in the winter time. We don't want to just pay people to sit around. That's, no, that's, that's a kiss of good. death. No, it's yeah. horrible. It's like, we want meaningful work out there. So I think you'd so, have a stir crazy workforce if you allow people to do that. I, I think it would be awful. Nobody, nobody wants that life. Yeah. Um, at least, at least in my mind. So, um, I'm too yeah. much of a busy body. I'd go nuts. Totally. You know, you'd be causing problems for other people. <laughs> if I already am. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah, so next question, we're going to get into hiring. And now this is one of those things that it's, our, our system of hiring, I will say that the Bureau of Land Management has a much better system and more efficiencies on hiring anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a returnee seasonal or if you're a brand new recruit versus the Forest Service. I will say that. And that's my belief. You may or may not agree with me, but that's fine. Um, so how do we address the hiring? So one of the questions is, how do we improve the transparency and honesty with hiring and performance incentives, pay rates, benefits, and retirement when advertising these fly, these uh, fire positions? And now, I know I sound like a hypocrite saying this because I'm talking about hiring to the to you, right? You're you're like at the top, <laughs> practically, of the Bureau of Land Management. And I had an announcement last spring saying that I am going to cease all... Uh, outreaches and recruitment announcements for the federal government. It doesn't matter which one, just because of the fact that there's been so much concern regarding pay benefits, uh, retirement, all that stuff. So I said, no more. <laughs> Let's talk about hiring. How do we improve this whole situation? And I know this is a large topic. Right. Um, I don't, I don't know that we're any better than the Forest Service. Frankly, I, I, if we are, then who that's trouble. From my experience, every time I've put in for a Bureau of Land Management job, uh-huh. I would always get an interest call. Oh, that's good. That, I mean, that's, that's, so that's step number one. I mean, that, you know, if nothing else, there should be somebody you can call and say, I've applied to your district for this job. You know, what can you tell me? So, so that would be, that would be set number one. Um, you know, I know the question is talking about transparency and, and mm-hmm. incentives with the announcements. Yeah. And with the announcements Probably the problem is there's too much information in there, frankly. It's like, I'm sure it's all there, but can the nor- can a normal person, and by normal, I mean somebody especially new, trying to trying to figure out their, their way in the federal government, um, can there be any way for them to actually read something that's posted on USA Jobs and understand mm-hmm. what the hell it means? I mean, I think you or I could say, oh, you're going to apply for a temporary job. Okay, that means you could uh, opt into health insurance if you want. You're guaranteed... Um, you know, 90 days of 90 days of employment, you're going to do two weeks of training and uh, you can't work beyond six months unless Congress says it's OK. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you or I could summarize that for people. And you got to reapply next year if you want to if you want to if you want to work again. Yeah. And this doesn't count towards retirement if you decide you want to do this as a career. I, I can do that in 30 seconds if yeah, I were talking really to somebody. Easy. But if somebody's reading USA Jobs and trying to figure it out from there, that's pretty horrible. You I was about word vomit. Holy shit. Yeah. And, and it's it's 
It's written by HR professionals, you know, because they have to. And um, I, I guess there's a liability threshold that you have to, like a criteria you have to meet with all the information that you advertise, right? And and we're applying this USA jobs uh, model, which is really for more permanent employees, for people who are kind of, I, I want to say, know what they're doing more, but you know, it's more, it's more for those folks, for those folks who are, who are, who are familiar with the system than it is for people brand new. It feels like to me. Mm -hmm. And so, and so what we've done with our external affairs stuff, staff is um, because, because we do a lot of, well, we do all the temporary hiring for all the DOI bureaus uh, out of NIFSI. And we do much of the hiring for many of the BLM states, to, you know, less a couple, we do all the fire hiring for them. Um, we have an incredible external affairs staff who, put out videos on how to apply. They put on videos on where job opportunities are, you know, and who to, who to contact. So really try to make common sense investments in, in messaging, especially in social media for people so that they're not, you know, we just say, Oh yeah, just look at USA jobs and put in fire and you'll see opportunities <laughs> like kids of death. Good luck. Never, never going to happen. <laughs> um, just this week, we in the BLM have been pushing, um, uh, trying to hire a hundred, a hundred interns across the bureau to do all sorts of different stuff. So high school kids graduating from high school, especially and college kids who, who might want to work in the federal government and trying to lure them in as interns and they would go back to school, you know? And, uh, and so I've been talking to some of my daughter's, um, uh, schoolmates in, in her high school saying, cause I know some of them want to, want to do fire. And I've been saying, I've been pushing, pushing job announcements and I'm saying, all right, you could apply to this. There are fire, there are fire jobs in here. You could work fire, go to, go to forestry school or whatever you're going to do and then come work for us. And then when you graduate, you could, you could be a, a full-time employee. But I've been trying to talk them through these systems like, well, how do you do this? And, it, and it's great for me to actually try to talk through the federal hiring system with a high school student. There is nothing better and nothing will tell you that things are tough for, for, you know, a normal human being trying to negotiate USA jobs than trying to talk somebody through it. I mean, I hope that some of those kids have got applications in, you know, fingers crossed because otherwise I'm a terrible teacher. But um, it's not lost on us that this is a really cumbersome system. You know, we're, we're doing our best to really explain to people and to get their applications in and then to, and then to treat their applications fairly on the far end. But people make mistakes all the time in those yeah. complicated systems. I know one of your questions is, can we get out of USA jobs? No, we can't. But nobody, yeah. there's nobody not complaining about it. There's a double negative for you. There is nobody not complaining about USA jobs in any, in any place in government. Uh, we're just, we're, we're using the tool the best we can and trying to, trying to work around the edges of it. And make it work for us, but it's a it's a challenge. It doesn't help us for sure. Yeah, and USA Jobs is a very archaic and clunky and cumbersome system, man. It, it, it it's terrible. And <laughs> is this a question it, or is no? This it just is. A just, this is just me bitching okay, about it okay. because it, nobody likes to, especially on the Forest Service side, no one likes to try and apply to a new position on the road in the middle of August. And I think that the oh, timing, yeah. sometimes the timing with these job announcements is right. just piss poor. Yeah. Now, how do we go about fixing that and getting away from USA jobs? I think that USA jobs is here to stay, right? It's too big. It's uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's a third party, uh, contractor that developed the website. Oh, I'm and sure. Now we utilize that exclusively. I'm not sure if that's factual or not. Someone will correct me. It sounds like a good story. I, I probably so I'm sure we didn't, we didn't invent it in house. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we paid good money for USA jobs. Is that, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. In a long sense. I, yes. <laughs> I will say, um, it is tough trying to recruit jobs in the summer. If you're trying to, uh, you know, I found with these high school kids, I'm trying to counsel, um, you know, what? you need to know in October, even in the BLM, you need to know in October, and November that you want to fly for, apply for a job in, you know, uh, Billings, Montana for the following summer. It's like, I don't know. You're expecting high school kids to make that decision in the fall of their senior year for yeah. the following summer. That's a crazy system right there. So I love these internships that we're flying right now because it's, it's way closer to summer and kids are actually worried about what they're doing in the summer. But you know, it's hard enough for adults to think that far in advance, much less for, for teenagers to think that much in advance. So, you know, we need a system where we're not trying to recruit people the year before for our summer jobs. Some of that comes back to giving people permanent status earlier in their career. So they're not having to make those decisions. So they're already in the system. So we can take them in at the GS3 level and actually in the new series, go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if they want to stick. I and mean, we can fly these jobs in series steps that are tied to one another. So that in, in, in essence, they come in at the three and they get spit out the other end at the eight mm -hmm. and, and the, the career you know, pipeline and the career ladder pipeline, you know, Whatever jobs that are tied it. together. Um, 
it's a great opportunity. So the new series is perfect for that. And we're get, we got to exploit it. So people don't have to negotiate USA jobs annually, which is a kiss of death. It's hard, man. It sucks, but you have to do it. It sucks. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I, I could go talking on about uh, USA jobs all day, but Let's just leave that one. Like, <laughs> yes. So general operations. So the next question would be, will the BLM be following suit with the United States Forest Service proposal to convert all permanent seasonal employees to permanent full-time? Now, let's be specific there. Permanent seasonal and permanent full-time PFTs are wildly different things. And we already kind of, we, we've honestly beat this subject to death. We've talked about this several times, but what about once one point of clarification there is the permanent seasonal employees. Like, are we trying to make more of a push for that to replace our temporary seasonal yes. workforce? Yes. Okay. And so what I described before of 80%, 20%, that 20% would be temporary seasonal. The 80% would be made up of a combination of permanent full-time and permanent seasonal otherwise known as career seasonal. Uh, and the bulk of our workforce, you know, used to be temporary. It used to be a third, a third, a third, um, basically. So figure a thousand in each of those columns, a thousand PFTs, a thousand career seasonals and a thousand temps. We want to take that thousand temps, turn it into something more like, you know, 400 and then take those 600 and move them into the other two categories. I also don't want to make every, I don't want to convert every, every uh, career seasonal employee into a permanent full-time. Because yeah, you'd lose Because they'll quit. Yes, You'll lose right. People. Exactly. Yeah, no, I'm not going to tell people they have to do that, but we want to offer it to people, but yeah. uh, we don't want to force it on people who, who want to do, you know, within reason, other stuff as well. Um, we've got room for all those folks, we think. So from experience, uh, when I was a, a, an apprentice for the Forest Service, uh, I was in a situation where I was being politely asked, see, forced to convert into my position as a permanent uh, full-time. And what was the thing I did? I found a new job. Right. Yeah. I wasn't going to do that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a good, good thing. Yeah. We have the work. It's, it's a hard thing because we are telling Congress, we've got all this work to do and we need people permanently. Mm -hmm. But, but um, I think we also need to be respectful of people wanting to do, uh, you know, a couple months outside, outside federal government. And uh, I think there's room for it. Copy that. We've already beat the heck out of that question with the year-round insurance coverage for temp seasonals. Ah, new complex IMTs. What are the benefits and drawbacks for this new program? Um, so the drawbacks are, so the idea is that we won't have type one and type two teams. We will have just teams and those teams will flex according to the needs of the incident. So a team can flex, grow bigger and handle a large, complicated type one fire. And then they could um, stay normal, stay their normal core size and handle a less complex type two incident. And we will manage all teams as if they're one kind of team and um, put them on some kind of more formal rotation up at the higher planning levels. Uh, and we will manage workload better, we think. We will equalize experience opportunities so that teams all get a share of the incident assignments so we don't have losers and winners. And we also don't have teams that get work so hard that they burn out. Um, the idea is that we can make better use of people if we don't send teams out loaded for bear when they only need to be loaded for partridge. Um, so, you know, that is a problem. So you got people, you got people mobilizing that you don't really need them. And uh, that's, that's wasteful of their time and wasteful of, of, you know, scarce resources that the country needs to manage fires in other places. So that's the idea. It's a change in the way we do business. Um, so the downside is, uh, right now, you get a team and you've got a group of people who go out as a team. And if not, all those people get to go out all the time. You lose a little esprit de corps. You lose a little teamwork. You lose a little familiarity um, in the interest of making more resources available in, in the bigger picture. So that's that's a downside for sure. Um, I think we to do this, we need to invest more in training. So we need to do a better job of preparing our teams to manage incidents. And so we need to train better at the type three level, at the type two level. Uh, we know we need to invest more in training to make people feel like a complex incident team when it comes in is going to be able to handle their fire, their very complicated fire. We need to sell that our type, formerly type two teams can do the work. Yeah. We know they can do the work because we force them to do the work all the time anyways. We say, you know what? We don't have a type one team for that fire. Uh, you guys got to go. And, uh, and so, and they rise to the occasion and they do it. So we want to make it so they don't have to rise to the occasion that that is a capability they know they have. Uh, the other downside, I think, is there are some folks who aren't interested in maybe being on some of those 
gnarly type one fires on the mm-hmm. Angeles. Uh, and I'm raising my hand as one, you know, <laughs> as a right former, you, as man. a former ops chief. <laughs> um, but I, but I think we need to get people, we need to make people feel confident that they can handle most situations and that we'll be able to flex and, and make this work. But I think, you know, big picture, it looks like a good plan. I think we should try it. We've been trying for 10 years to make some kind of change in mm-hmm. incident management team rotation and composition. And we've always run up against, frankly, against against the we never have done it this way roadblocks. If there's two things that firefighters hate, it's change in the way things are. <laughs> totally. And, I, you know, we got to be mindful that these are volunteers. So mostly team teams are their volunteers. That's not their day job, mostly. Yeah. And, and they don't have to go and do these team assignments. So... We also don't want to force people out by forcing change on them, but we're hoping that um, enough people will see the benefit to it that we'll both keep most of the people in the team game because because the the workload is frankly more manageable and we'll attract more people because the workload is more manageable. Uh, that's the hope. But there are some risks and we're hoping it doesn't explode in our faces because it's crazy. It's crazy talk. It's change. It's change. But, but, but yeah. we're going down the toilet, frankly. You know, we're losing teams. We're losing team members. We got to do something. We got to try something different. This is this is an attempt to try something different. I think, you know, team membership might be up a little bit this year. It's hard. It's first first signs. But but maybe uh, maybe we're turning the corner a little bit. We We hope so. Cause uh, we need those folks. Oh yeah. And that's another thing too, with, uh, between attrition and retirement, I guess, well, people moving on to different agencies and retirement, right. We're losing those, those hitters of wildland fire management. Right. And it's not like we're backfilling these positions at a very steady pace. So I think that something like this, do you think it's, I guess the better question to ask is, do you think that this is something that is going to be proven useful out of utility for a current state, or is it something that is going to have longevity? Uh, I think it's both. I think it's, it's born of utility, but I think it's going to have longevity because I think it, it makes more sense to how we actually operate in the world. Um, so, so I think that's good. I'm, I mean, I think we have other, we have other avenues open to us. This may stem the tide of, of attrition, but I think we can staff up better by making better use of cooperators, by being more, um, more receptive to people with other skill sets coming into fire, uh, just outside you know, perspective, maybe. Yeah. And RPL. So recognition of prior learning, we talk about it all the time, but we don't maybe do as good of a job as we could do in, in saying, yeah, you've got that skill set. We think we can apply it in this way and, uh, let, and let's do that. So I think our cooperators, especially local, um, local municipal departments, rural fire departments have really been pointing out that, um, we can be a little, uh, rigid and, uh, and we should be a little more, a little more, um, open to, to folks coming in and helping out. And I think, I think we can do a better job of that. We can do a much better job. And I know we're working on this on the commission, uh, the wildland fire commission that's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, congressionally mandated on uh, making the agreements process easier so that we can bring people in just through business processes that are more nimble. So, so, you know, we're not turning people away because we can't figure out how to pay them. That's, uh, that's criminal. So yeah, uh, we get, <laughs> yeah, and that's one we can fix without Congress telling us to fix it. Yeah, so that's an administrative uh, kind of, that's hurdle. an administrative thing. And, and we got to get out of our own way, uh, as, as the federal bankrollers of much of the system, right? That's, that's our responsibility. So we need to figure that out. Uh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily have to wait for the commission to tell us we should figure that out or Congress to tell us we should figure it out. No, I agree. Okay. So we kind of talked on this subject as well, but the obvious issues with stagnation and upward mobility from the GS three to GS eight level. So let's, this is the pipeline that we we're referring to earlier. Let's talk about that. Like what are some of the new things that are really sticky that stand out with the new pipeline that's going to be hopefully into, implemented here with the 0456? Well, yeah, I think what we just talked about, like tying a, flying a job as a three, four, five. So, you know, you come in as a, say a, a career or seasonal appointment, maybe mm-hmm. at the four level. So maybe we can get you a four, five, six position. You come in and, and you, uh, you apply once you go through the system, you, you get to the sixth level and it's not until then after a couple of years, a couple, three years that you have to actually, you know, think about applying for another job. Applying competitively too. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so you've got that built in where you can just say, you know what, if you come into us at this pay grade, you will come out, talk about transparency. You, if you stick with us this long, we'll achieve this pay grade in this amount of time. Um, you know, that's your expectation. That's, that's where you can go. I mean, we can do that in this new series way better than we could before. So it needs to happen. 
It, it, it will happen. <laughs> Good. Frankly. It will happen because if nothing else, it saves us administrative burden on hiring people and processing applications, all that kind of crap that slows us down. So, um, so that'll happen. And, and frankly, that, that job can go from the GS three, three, four, five, six, seven, you can go all the way up to the eight level, I think. And they're, they're all essentially, you know, one, one job series that just carries you all the way through. So, um, that's a great opportunity as long as the place you're, you're at has, you know, enough positions at the higher grade levels. Um, so that's great. Um, the other career pipeline we need to make better use of are internships or academies, you know, call it what you like. Um, we're flying these 499 internships. They're called, they're, uh, they're fire interns, mm -hmm. but we have another one in the works that uh, should be a DOI standard coming out soon. Same sort of thing. So like a, it's like, it's an, it's an internship, frankly. And, and okay. so, you know, it's another career progression thing and, and the foot idea in the door. foot in the door yeah. and try to get people varied experience, you know, all that kind of thing that we used to do at the Jack Academy in California, the Forest Service is still doing along with some DOI partners. So, um, so those opportunities are out there. Um, that's great. And then finally, uh, the four, the disappearance of the 401 qualification up at the, up at the upper grades, uh, is a great thing so that people can carry their four, five, six qualifications all the way up into a GS 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, if they want to, if they stick with us without changing series, without having to go back to college, without having to worry about their transcripts, you know, all the kind of, all the kind of stuff that they have to worry about now. Um, we're going to take people at their, at their value, right? Not at their academic degree, but, yeah. but really for, for what they bring to the job from their background, you know, it could be background in business. It could be background in education. It could be just high school education, you know, it, it could be it, OTJ as well. It could be OTJ, which, uh, and right now we still make people go through kind of silly exercises to, you know, get an academic stamp where, um, they don't necessarily need it. So that's going to be a great thing. Um, that's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. And we're working on that now. Not everybody wants to be a, f you know, what we call a 401, but for the people who do, at least they can see themselves in that job more readily, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're rolling those out soon. We're just putting the last touches on some of the FMO jobs, the PDs that are, that are, that are going with those. You know, we have a deadline of June to really start implementing these four five sixes. So we're, we're scrambling to make that happen. Yeah. That 401 series thing, that that's going to be a huge thing because now people actually have without going to school necessarily. Like, I mean, honestly, a degree in, I don't know, biology is probably not going to teach you much about fire management because that's a lot of stuff that you have to learn in the field. And granted, there is an educational component in there where you can apply some of that stuff, but to, rem I guess, remove it is probably one of the best decisions out there for, you know, having that glide path to those upper levels of management. Yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm actually one of those people who went to college for that. So I went to a land grant school to Colorado state and got a wildland fire management uh, master's degree. It's very specific though. It was. And it, and it, and it was before 401. It was because I was interested and because I thought, well, I want to be an FMO one day. And so this will be handy. Um, not knowing whether it would be useful or not, you know, frankly, it was just like, well, what am I, I'm going to school anyways. I've got my off seasons off. I'm going to go do this and mm -hmm. it'll probably come in handy. It did come in handy with the 401. For sure. And I learned stuff that uh, I wouldn't have learned other places, but does, does it make me a better fire manager? You know, not, not necessarily. I learned, I, I could have learned some similar things going to business school or going to architecture school or not going to school at all and, and doing an internship at a design house in New York city. Right. Could have learned in a lot of different ways. So there are a lot of different paths and I'm glad we're doing that. But for people who have an interest it, education is a great thing. It's like, it I would never tell people don't go to co school. I just say, go to school for something that interests you, not for something that somebody else is telling you should interest you. Uh, that's, that's the primary thing. Just kind of meet people where they are. And, uh, I, there's so many MBAs out there that we, that had to go back and get forestry units credits. And, and then they come back to work and are using their MBA skills more than anything else. It's like, man, we got this backwards. <laughs> kind of screwed don't the pooch on this one. Yes. But it was, <laughs> it was, it was a good attempt to, to make, to, this was an old attempt to professionalize the workforce. Same thing we're doing now. And it was, it was an attempt by some folks to say, you know what, if you're going to be part of these teams that are helping manage the land, you need some academic background in land management. It's not a stupid thing. It's but, not. No. But, but what we know now is that managers have so much more to do and it's, it's, they be as well served to go to, you know, psychology classes than, uh, than anything else. It's so, a human, human thing. <laughs> yeah. And 20 years from now, I guarantee you the conversation you and I are having right now is going to look incredibly stupid to the people then they're going to say, you know, listen to what these jackasses were saying. They <laughs> probably they didn't know what they were talking about and it's going to be absolutely true. But, uh, that just, that just goes with the territory of, uh, of, you know, 
making <laughs> of saying something out loud. I guess our problem is we're saying things out loud. Thinking out loud, saying thinking, out loud. Thinking out loud is where I get into trouble. Yes. Yeah, me, you and me both, brother. Yep. Well, that's pretty much all the uh, questions that have been submitted from uh, our list, my listeners, uh, the Anchor Point listeners. Um, now, I kind of want to pick your brain about some of the finer details, and we can make this quick. I understand you got to go here pretty soon, but as far as the presidential budget that was released, the details of that, can you give us a top level overview of what that was and what it means for the firefighters on the ground? Because I know this is not BIL. This is something that isn't passed yet. So let's talk about that briefly, mm -hmm. what you know about it. I don't want to get too off into the weeds with it in specifics because there's not a lot of specifics to be had yet. Well, there are a couple of good things in the president's budget. Um, uh, housing is one right off the bat that we should highlight. Huge. So there's an additional 20 million. Now I'm, I'm drawing this from memory. I think it's 20 million more. Um, anyways, there's a sizable investment in, in our facilities, fire facilities accounts in our, in the DOI side of the house, particularly to fund projects that, that, um, have to do with firefighter housing. So, um, that would be a great thing to have that, um, those projects, there aren't a lot of them. And honestly, that's not the solution, you know, to our housing problems. It's bigger than that. Yeah. It is huge, right? We have, we had a $170 million worth of, worth of fire facilities investment we could do, but you know, we're not going to turn it down. So, um, so that would allow us to tick off some needed investments in firefighter housing. So that's a great thing. Uh, obviously we talked about the pay supplement. So the money to make, to, to do the pay supplement for fire folks without having to make cuts elsewhere is in that president's budget. Um, so if we got, if somebody said, yes, this pay table that we're talking about, the one that's posted on grassroots, if this pay table got implemented, we have to, we'd have to fund it some other way. We'd have to figure out funding that we would, we would take from. So we would have to take from some other part of the program to fund that pay supplement without the new money that's in the president's budget. The president's budget also allows us to do more workforce transformations, to do more of this, you know, fewer temporary seasonals and more permanent positions. So it allows us to knock off more of that. Mm -hmm. um, or what we'd really like to do, say, add a couple of crew members to your basic 20 person crew. So, uh, so your hotshot crew, your veterans crew on the BLM side could go out with 24 or not necessarily roll with 24, but hire 24 if we could, if we could find 24, right? Yeah. Uh, staff up your engines better, staff up your helitech better, so given um, more opportunity for, for folks to actually, you know, duck out for a couple of days and take a couple of days off if the crew's staffed more fully then maybe people have an opportunity to flex a little bit more. So that's the thought. So we'd like to ne not necessarily hire a bunch more crews or more engines, but staff more fully the stuff we have so that, so that people have a little more breathing room uh, on their, on their crews. So that would, that would get funded um, more fuels work, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff that that's all included in the president's budget, but those investments in our workforce and the, and the pay and that housing are key parts of that president's budget that we would we would love to see make it into some kind of appropriations bill. Sometimes this stuff doesn't work exactly the way it seems. So sometimes people will always say, "Oh, the president's budget it's dead on arrival," right? And you you hear that all the time. Not necessarily, but that's that jaded thing. With, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, in its entirety, yeah. It's, sometimes you consider the president's budget a statement of statement of policy intention more than it is a blueprint for an actual budget. But the, but the great part about this budget is that it sets out some, some very concrete things that, um, that an appropriator could put in an appropriation bill and say, yeah, you know, see this thing that they were talking about with firefighter housing, let's make sure that makes it in the appropriations bill. So it's not necessarily the budget itself gets accepted, but elements of it can creep into appropriations bill that we see finally. Into permanent law even. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and appropriations, you know, bills are essentially law, right? Because yeah. they, they are laws, um, even though they don't seem like it. So um, absolutely. And so that pay table could just end up in in an approach bill. And if I know grassroots, they're, um, they're talking full time to appropriators about how to make some of this stuff happen. So I'm, I'm not allowed to have those conversations, but, uh, but I think they are. And I think, if, I think that's their job. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, you know, so I'm sure there's some conversations going about what's in those budgets. And on the forest service side, I'm not so familiar with exactly what's in their stuff, but it's probably, probably similar. I know the facility stuff I think is, is in theirs as well. Yeah. I know there's a bunch of gripes right now with the B, the BIL versus the presidential budget. And one of them was the pay rates. I know that there's going to be a lot of talk about how some of these folks are actually taking a pay cut comparatively speaking to the BIL. And now <sighs> I want to play devil's advocate here with, with the folks out here listening. Right. 
And are you going to take the long-term gains over the short-term band-aid, as you so eloquently put it earlier? Because that's exactly what BIL is, is a band-aid, right? Mm. So how do we, one, avoid people chasing hazard pay in overtime with this new proposal? And two, how do we kind of redirect the the discussion to make it more equitable? Because people are expecting like the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law pay in this new presidential budget, right? right? So yeah, this is, this is going to get into the weeds real quick, but yeah, this is going to get into the math. Um, so the math is if what, what right now the bill does just in your base pay is not just in base pay in the, in the solution yeah. in the 24 budget, it's a combination of, um, more overtime, more overtime paid on off, on off district or off unit assignments and, uh, and kind of paid, um, as guarantee on assignments. Not questionable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's this 15 and nine concept that when, uh, you know, if you run off on a 14 day assignment, you are paid from the hour you leave till the hour you come back and you're paid 15 hours of straight time and overtime and then nine hours of standby rate flat out. So, um, so on the, on the plus side, that kind of thing, when you go off on off duty assignments allows you to actually not push the envelope on the assignment itself. I mean, you know, just frankly, from a firefighter point of view, if you think about it, it's like, all right, I'm, I'm paid 15 and nine regardless. So I'm not going to hang out here on division X, uh, for a couple extra hours, sharpening tools. I'm going to go back to camp or wherever I'm going to go to my, wherever my spike base, my spike camp and, uh, get rested and bed down. Um, so that's a good thing, right? It takes the incentive away from stupid, stupid logging, uh, on incidents. Like everybody Not that hates. that happens, yeah. but, but. Did you show a lunch? What do you mean? Did you show a lunch? Yeah. Did you show a lunch? Age. Okay, come on. Can, can <laughs> I, can we stop hearing about showing lunch, right? So you don't have to show a lunch. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, you don't, in fact, you don't even have to do timesheets as far as I know. You just say, I mean, you got to do timesheets for your home unit, but you don't have to tune in a CTR because yeah. you're just paying 15 and nine. Awesome. Save the administrative burden, save a lot of the paperwork for everybody. And then. And then know that, um, you know, if, if indeed your, your assignment on division X is over at nine o'clock, then you can go back to camp. Now you, you may sometimes somebody may say, yeah, can you hang out for another hour? We need to tie off this piece of line. You may say, sure. And you may get screwed out of one hour of overtime because you're only going to get paid half time. You're going to get paid a standby rate for that half hour, you know, for that hour that you stayed out longer. But in the, in the long run, you're, you're getting, you're making 15s, flat out 15s, and you're making nines on top of it. So just from firefighter math, you figure, Ooh, that's probably in most cases going to equal more pay than we did before for those assignments we take. Mm -hmm. Plus it gives us incentive to get adequately rested because we're not, you know, we're not getting paid for those nine hours. We're getting paid to, yeah. we're getting paid to sleep because our time is not our own when we're off duty. No, assignment. You're you're off stuck in camp. You're stuck in camp. What people have been complaining about all along. It's not my own time. So, so the math on that is, the, the base pay is not the same as bill. It's not $20,000 or 50%, whichever is less, but, um, but the combination of the base pay that they are adding plus the increased overtime calculated on, you know, on people not making 1200 hours of overtime, but making something more like 700 hours at most, something like that. So they're, they're calculating it based on people not having to work as much overtime and still coming out to close to equal to what the bill is paying. It doesn't say you're going to make that regardless, no overtime whatsoever, because I think the reality is that people are going to work overtime because that's the job. Yeah. Um, you know, we, you, it's just, it just goes with the territory that you're going to, you're not going to be working nine to five, five days a week. Um, that's, that's not the life of a firefighter, but, but hopefully the pay is better and people have a longer season and enough money over what they used to make that they can, um, feel free to, to within reason, turn down some assignments, you know, be a, be a little more flexible with the, the time they take, not be chasing every single fire assignment. I mean, frankly, if you're on a crew, you're on a crew. Yeah. And the crew's going to go, there. crew's going to go when the, the crew. crew goes. Yes. Yes. And within, you know, if the crew's got 22 and they can live without you and you ask, uh, you know, ahead of time and get your leave in there and, and you want to miss a roll, you know, that's, that's one thing, but you know, often you're on a crew, you don't want to miss a roll with the crew either. So those are crew dynamics. Those are, those are that's a whole a different thing. thing though. Yeah. You're going to talk with crews yeah. later today. You can ask them about that. So, um, so I know how that goes, but if you're a more independent resource, like a jumper, for instance, or, or working on a helitech crew, where IMT. IMT for sure, where you have more flexibility, you control your own time more than, than definitely you, you can, 
um, it feels like you would, you would be able to, um, say, well, I'm making enough money. I can turn down a, a week's worth of overtime to go to a family reunion. Um, hopefully people can make that choice, but we're never going to legislate away from people wanting to chase overtime. Sometimes there are people out there every hour is every hour I don't make is an hour I'm not going to make. Right. And those, that's just in their That's in their nature. I'd hate to be the one who says you may not work more than X hours of overtime because that feels unduly restrictive. But I, but at some point managers do need to step in and say, you know what, you're, you're going too hard. You yeah, need to, you need you need to ratchet back. But there are folks who are motivated by making as much money as possible. Um, you know, within reason, I think they're part of the culture as well. And, and, uh, you know, as long as they're not endangering themselves or other people, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta see that that's a, yeah. that's a lifestyle as well. Right. And, and that's part of the culture and we probably need to live with some of that stuff, but that doesn't, that shouldn't be the model for everybody out there in the world. That's not a healthy lifestyle. Oh, hundred percent, man. So I guess one question that I have following up with that is how does this affect like initial attacks? Say you, you do initial attack on an emergent incident and then it rolls into a two week assignment. Now that first, like say operational shift, you go up to 32 hours or whatever you right. cap, you cap out. Uh, how does that standby pay get affected? Does you know, it, is it affected at all or? You know, I, I understand it. I understand it probably as much as you do. And, and my, our initial concern was for initial attack folks and all like, you're not, you're not telling folks that they're going to IA fire. And then at the end of 15 hours, you're on standby, you're on standby. That's bullshit. <laughs> it's people are going to be pissed. Well, it's, 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 um, not going to help us contain fires, right? If people, no. you know, because you've, you know how it goes, you've worked since nine in the morning and, and at, at seven o'clock at night, um, the lightning storm rolls through and that's when you start work, right? Yep. If you're going to stop at 15 hours or stop getting paid at 15 hours, that's not going to work. So it doesn't work that way. So it says you're on initial tech it's hours as worked up until blah, blah, blah hours. Right. Um, so, th so that's fair. It, you know, it, it, it separates initial attack from, from really those, those off unit assignments and makes stuff. it, makes a distinction between the two. So, so for initial attack firefighters who spend most of their time in their home unit, they're paid the way they've always have been paid my understanding, but the rates might be a little bit different. So, um, so I, I think, I think the bill, this, this bill, I'm calling it the bill solution, but this solution in the 24 budget really does, it, it kind of um, thinks about overtime and fire assignments in those 14 day off duty, off unit assignments, um, which is not our bread and butter in the BLM or no. we're really initial attack organization. So I, I'm, I haven't really figured out the ins and outs of how that would work for, for a crew that doesn't spend as much time on the road you know, typical, typical engine crew that's uh, locked down at home more. I'm, I'm hoping the math works out for those folks as well, but I haven't really explored it to, to great lengths. It's really hard because there's a lot of what ifs. There's a lot of what there's ifs. There's a ton of what ifs. And that's every season. I mean, you can talk, I mean, what was it last year when we were talking about predictive services, it was going to be doom and gloom. It was going to be 2020, right. 2019 right. all over again. Right. And it didn't show up. Nothing happened. Didn't yeah. show up. Yeah. That's just part of the dice that we roll. It's feast or famine in this industry. And totally. it's, I don't think that's really ever going to change. Can we make some uh, administrative and legislative changes to help remove that? We can, but it's never going to be... It, it's never going to be perfect. There's yeah. no such thing, but we shouldn't let perfect get in the way of good. Well, I'm, uh, so I'm not a firefighter anymore. I, I wonder what the, what does the slow season look like anymore? Right. Is it 500 hours? I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, I mean, my take is there's no such thing as a slow season anymore. Really. It's just like, there's a, there's what used to be, what used to be a, a moderate season is now just kind of the average low season. I think everything's moved up one phase. It feels like it. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think, I think your listeners probably tell me better than, than I could say, but you know, my experience is that people are working, um, a lot and, uh, maybe not as much as they always want to, but, but plenty. And in most cases, in many cases, you know, more than they want. Yeah. So I, I don't think, you know, the, a slow season really, um, hurting people doesn't feel like it's in the cars. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel like we can have a season that's so slow. Like some of the one I experienced when I was growing up, you know, some, some really low overtime seasons, which were really hard to survive on. Uh, I, I just doesn't feel like we're going to see one of those in a long time. I don't think we will, especially with the, I mean, I guess we have to do more with less in the context of like, we have more frequent, more intense fires. We have more starts, both human and I guess more lightning as well. No yeah. natural causes. Yeah. But also we are having less people as well that we have to work with. So we are forced to being right. doing what more with less. Right. Right. 
So as long as these po- folks out there, they're one, not endangering themselves and two, they're being, I guess what I want to say rewarded for their efforts. I mean, yeah, you got all the glory and being a firefighter. This is a kick ass job and I wouldn't replace my time, my 11 years in the BLM and the forest service for anything. It's made me who I am today. But if we can make it even better and keep pressing those issues and progressing further into a more modernized organization, organizations, I think that it's going to be awesome. Look at that. You yeah. just summed it up nicely. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll say something all right. <laughs> well, Grant, I know you got to get out of here, man. Um, so we're at the end of the show now. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and answering all these questions. You are directly answering the boots on the ground questions that are just the hot button ticket items right now. So I definitely appreciate you taking the time with me and I'm very thankful for your uh, being here, man. No, That's I cool. Appreciate, appreciate you asking me, uh, you know, t- let me just say that none of these questions were a surprise. So, so that's good. That means that I'm hearing these same questions through other channels as well, but, uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk more directly to folks. And, um, I'll just, you know, put it out there that people can always pick up the phone and, and call us as well. You know, got a beef, got a compliment, whatever. Um, <laughs> give a, give a call. I'm sometimes there, always there, but, uh, no, we're always, we're always listening. We're always trying to pay attention. There's usually more to the story, but, uh, well, it's complex too. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes Sometimes. it's really simple and sometimes people need to just tell us how simple it is. So, you know, there is, there is that too. Yeah. Yeah. But at least you're willing to be at the position that you're at to listen to the, uh, your subordinates, if you will. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's, that's a good leadership quality to have. Yeah. They're not my subordinates. They're they're my peers. So, um, I think we're all in this together, right? I just get to represent them sometimes. So, um, so I appreciate that's an honorable position to be in, but yeah, I, I just feel like we're all in this together. So 100%. Um, yep. Cool. Well, at the end of the show, I was given an opportunity for you to give a shout out, multiple, multiple shout outs to some homies, heroes, mentors. Who do you got for us? Oh my gosh. Chuck Sheely, man. He's, uh, he's out there. He's, he's the person who got me into the business. So, um, so Chuck, if you're listening, uh, power to you. Yeah. Thanks for all you did for me. Right on, man. Well, Grant, thank you so much for being on the show. Hope everybody enjoyed. All right. Thank you. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with Grant Beebe. Yeah. So, Grant, I just want to say thank you for uh, being on the show and not pulling any punches, um, even though I'm sure uh, a lot of people are going to be watching this. Uh, I'm glad that you had the courage and came onto the show and got real with people and described yourself and talked about yourself and then also all the other things. I mean, I did have a very extensive list of topics uh, to uh, give you and they were all crowdsourced from the boots on the ground. So uh, yeah, let's uh, try and make things better for the folks uh, moving into the future. And once BIL expires, let's have uh, let's hope we can actually have something to continue on because once you take it away, it's going to be hard to come back. Yeah. Might lose a couple of folks. Anyways, yeah, like I said, folks, uh, I do not agree with everything he said. I do agree with some things, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be in the same uh, boat. Now, if he agrees with some of the stuff I said and disagrees with some of the stuff I said, well, that's just common discourse. And it's important that we have these conversations because how in the hell else are we going to identify what it is and also direct change to where it matters for the most people? With that being said, take this episode as you will, as you may. And if you want to love it, hate it, crap on it, crap on me, crap on Grant, that's completely up to you. However, I encourage everyone out there that's listening that if they do like something or don't like something, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to one, go and join Grassroots. Two, if you have the opportunity, go join Niffy. Three, make your voices heard in a respectful way, because if you don't, present solutions for a problem, then there ain't shit that's going to get done. And it's also important to make your voice heard in the right way. So with that, uh, I just want to once again, give a shout out to the Bureau of Land Management, the state of Nevada Bureau of Land Management. Got to show my love for my homies. I got to give a shout out to my buddy booze. Of course, dude, you killed it with the, uh, with the uh, seminar, man, the social wellness seminar. That was awesome. But I'd like to also give another special, uh, special, Thank you to Brock Ulig and Vanessa Marquez. 
because they're the ones who invited us down here and uh, made this all possible. So once again, thank you, everybody. Special shout out to our sponsors. We got Mystery Ranch built for the mission. Go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out that Backbone series because you'll be able to hopefully win one of those thousand dollar grants to continue your education and improve your state in fire. We also got Hot Shot Brewery, kick-ass coffee for the kickest assist cause. <laughs> Kickin'est assist? I don't even know. Anyways, it's kick-ass coffee, kick ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. And a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. We've got the ass movement, my boy booze, changing the way we bury our turds and trying to educate the public on with the finest of poo-bearing propaganda. Jeez, I cannot talk today. Go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement. And then last but not least, not a sponsor of the show, but a I'm a huge supporter of what they're doing over there. And that's going to be none other than the AWE or the American Wildfire Experience. Go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check them out. Bethany, you have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. As for the rest of you, you all know the drill. Stay safe, stay savage. Peace. Peace.